Broadcasting from their world headquarters in Texas, it's the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. The show that discusses arcade repair, restoration, news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Tim and Jonathan. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show for August 2020. Tim, this is the episode 42, I believe, of the live show. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, and we're sorry for the little bit of delay that we had due to uh, a little bit of an absence for Tim. Tim has been working hard at Dairy Queen, uh, getting some stuff set up. I'm sure he'll enlighten us on that. But before I get to him, let me introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Lee Young, and I'm the producer, director, and editor of the Arcade Repair Tips video series. And joining me today, I already mentioned his name, but to give him a formal introduction, is Mr. Tim Peterson. And uh, I would say this way. Way, but you're actually this way on my screen so uh, there we go but uh tim is mr arcade repair tips and hopefully we're going to get to answer some questions tonight i wasn't so sure tim you're making me nervous uh but me and the live chat had a lively discussion while you were uh while you were frantically driving from dairy queen so why don't you give us the scoop well appreciate everybody for uh sticking around i hope that it's worth your trouble but uh yeah we uh opened a brand new store it's actually a replacement store where they took one that had been around since 1973 and it looked like it. It was like the Dairy Queen I remember working in when I was a teenager. And they tore it completely down and built a kind of a new state-of-the-art Dairy Queen. Maybe by the next time I'll try to get some pictures uploaded or something to show everybody. But kind of like a 2020 version of it, you know, a lot of high-tech uh, computerized grills prior stuff like that uh, made it make things go busy but of course uh, they haven't had anything for three weeks while the process was happening so everybody wants to come see the new Dairy Queen uh, people in town are proud of it a lot of people coming in bringing the kids so we haven't officially had the grand opening yet this is kind of a soft opening where we didn't tell anybody but word spread obviously pretty quickly because we are very busy today well and tim you know uh, i we actually did some testing last night just to make sure that we had all the tech ready for today and you were saying you get off at five you're already making me nervous because i knew you had a little bit of a drive then you had the traffic of course and you got off late so uh we understand though tim and i think everybody here understands like i said we had a great conversation with the live chat folks while you were on your way uh, getting ready for the live show and getting everything set up so uh, you know I, I will say that we've got youtube punk here we've got the real hammer billy lee he's says hello uh let's see we have zod zodhan is here we've got jason steverson uh louis is here tim our one of our great facebook mo moderators um am via yane fan is here and uh just a lot of a lot of great people here in the live chat joining us tonight tim and uh, we look forward to interacting with all of y'all during the show remember you can leave your questions and your comments in the live chat we'll try to get to those as the show progresses uh but tim is there anything else you want to mention before we roll into some questions no, let's get started. I've held everybody up long enough. Okay, well, let's do it then. So, Tim, before we actually get started in the questions, though, we did have a comment from the last show that I wanted to address here. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw that up here. And this is from Tim. Uh, not you, Tim. Different Tim. But um, we mentioned in the last show that you could jump over from one speaker to another if you want to do like a double mono setup on a Street Fighter 2. And what I really need to say was that you can, the best way to wire that is in series. And so um, the, the parallel wiring really doesn't work as well for this because it can sometimes overload the audio amp, which I knew this, but I forgot to mention on the live show. And so your best bet if you're going to go with like a double mono mono setup is to wire them in series. And so I'm going to read Tim's comment here, uh, Tim, so that way we can get across to everybody. Be a bit okay. careful when adding a second speaker to an audio amp circuit. If you wire the speakers in series, then the ohms on the amp will increase and make it less likely to overheat the amp. Parallel wiring has the potential to fry an audio amp and reduce the ohms beyond the amp's minimum rating. So if you're unable to verify the speaker ohm rating and amp minimum ohm rating, just go with series wiring method to be safe. Good luck. And this is something, Tim, I should have mentioned, like I said, when we answered the question on the last live show. But Tim, I've got the diagrams here as well, and you'll see just a straight speaker wiring at the the top but then you'll see the series wiring where you actually jump her over um, from one speaker to another and then have um, have the uh, basically the the, um, the plus at the front uh, that goes to the first speaker and then the and then uh, goes back to the ground on the other side but wiring them in series like that will make sure that you don't overload your audio amp, which is very important because, you know, Tim, on arcade games, a lot of times audio amps are built onto the board. So we don't want to overload those amps for fear that we may have to do a board level repair, correct? 
Yeah, and uh, this might be something they want to actually screenshot and print off or something. This is some really good information. Sometimes we're saying stuff and we kind of know this, but we don't always say stuff that we should or go into a little detail. So thank him for commenting on that and um, helping us bring it. Absolutely, to Tim. Thank you for the reminder on that. I just wanted to go ahead and give everybody the update on that so they knew. Try to use series wiring on speakers when possible. If you're trying to do you know multiple speakers to one line, uh, it will save you a little bit of, of, uh, of trouble with, uh, like he mentioned, overloading the amp. So there we go. Uh, Tim, we got some comments here. Um, YouTube Punk says, we stuck around because we heard Tim was going to give everyone the chat free blizzards. So, um, okay. <laughs> and, and Tim would say you heard wrong. I think would be, it would be the, 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 I made enough blizzards today. I'm good. Oh, okay. What did you have today? I want to know. I love blizzards. Well, the new one of the month is Oreo fudge brownie. Oh my goodness. But I want to try one that I never heard of. It's called, it was obviously one they had before I started there called Oreo cookie jar. Gotcha. And Never tried that one. It's got cookie dough and Oreo and fudge in it. See that so. one? That one sounds like it's right up in my alley. Oh, getting a hug there too, Tim. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's got a birthday present. Oh, there see. you go. So. She just turned 21. Oh my goodness! Happy birthday, uh, late. <laughs> oh, her boyfriend got her a pendant. Nice. Oh, that's very nice. All right. Let me see. All right. Okay. All right. Let me see what else we got here, Tim. Uh, YouTube Punk says I miss those old school Dairy Queens. Um, let's see. YouTube Punk says it needs a sign that says our ice cream machine actually works. You, you need a sign yeah. up there, unlike McDonald's, I hear. Uh, we actually have two. Up, we actually have four now. So it would really have to be a catastrophic day for all four to go down. There you go. Well, Tim, enough of the enough of the Dairy Queen talk. We'll go ahead and move on to our questions for this month. And the first one we have, Tim, is from Sean. So let's go ahead and throw it up here. And Sean says, "I'm trying to build an arcade from scratch. It was gutted except for the PCB. I've done. I've never done this before, but would love to make this my new hobby. Anyway, the schematics talk of a ground tree. Would this be what they are referring to?" Any help would be appreciated. So Tim, he's got a picture here, and these are the pictures that he sent. He sent a um, uh, basically a ground tree from the schematic for the board that he's trying to wire up, and then he sent uh, what looks like just a terminal, uh, like a, a barrier strip or a terminal strip. Is that really what Sean's looking for, or is he looking for something else? Well, I mean, it would work, but it's really not what we would call ideal for arcade games. Right. It, it has a kind of a different purpose for what he needs, he needs more of a um, jumper ground wire strip. And I think uh, you're going to show that in the next slide. Yeah, I'll go ahead and show it up here real quick. The difference is, um, is that it has the ground or common, so you don't have to have a ground for each one. Right, exactly. You see, so um, in the barrier strip that he showed, Tim, basically there was just one terminal or maybe two i couldn't tell if it was um if it was like a straight across connection between the two screws or if it was just a single but even if it's straight across you have to basically jumper the ground to each of those screws in order to get it to connect properly what something like this does tim this is a ground terminal distribution block what it does is as you can see um where that double um nut is with uh, at the uh -huh. end you just put the ground there and then all the other grounds can be distributed off of that and there's not additional connections that are needed and so uh, Tim, this is a really big one here, but um, you can get them in different um, different screws, different gangs, if you will. Um, so you don't have to get one this big necessarily, Sean, but you can get you something that has just like four or six on it, depending on how many ground wires you're going to need. But really what you want to go for is a ground distribution terminal block, something like that. Right. And I'll go ahead and read the whole slide so you guys can get it. While traditional barri uh, terminal barrier strip would work, it would re require you to jumper a ground wire to each terminal section along with an output wire in order to distribute it. Instead of going this route, look at a ground or common terminal distribution block. These are designed to specific designed specifically for this purpose. And Tim, we have a link here to Amazon uh, that they can click and that'll take them to some ground terminal distribution blocks. But Tim, these things make um, make ground wiring a snap because instead of having to um, like jumper all of your grounds off of the power supply, for instance, and you've got like 15 grounds under one screw or whatever it is, the distribution blocks give you the, a appropriate number of screws to make sure that you can get uh, the watt, your ground wires distributed where they need to go. And so it, it really saves you a lot of trouble. This one in here actually had a cover that goes over it too, which we re would recommend that you get one that has a cover over it so you don't have shorts. 
Um, you know, if you have, you know, if uh, if something comes in contact with that ground distribution strip, uh, it can short out if you're not careful. So, you know, try to get one that has a cover on it if possible. That will help with shorts. Tim, anything else for Sean before we move on? No, we want to, we don't want to de-emphasize the fact that it needs to be grounded because grounding is so important in any game. Um, you almost can't ground too much. I think uh, Pac-Man tried to. <laughs> you know, Pac-Man had grounds everywhere. But it really is important, guys, um, just an off topic, but kind of on that topic, is make sure that your grains are grounded good. We talk about a lot, our watch start at power. Even from the ground plug to the wall is so important. If that's broken, you're not getting proper grounding, you can have a lot of issues, or you're just asking for a lot of issues down the road. Absolutely. So proper grounding is very important with all of your arcade games, guys. So um, if you're wiring one from scratch, make sure that you put those grounds in there. And like Tim mentioned, have a ground coming all the way from the wall. It'll save you a lot of headaches and trouble in the future. So John, uh, Sean, hopefully it answers your question. And good luck wiring up your arcade board and cabinet. Now, Tim, I have a, a we had a question from Joshua. We actually answered while you were in in um, in transit to where you are now, and um, he was having a problem with a, a Miss Pat and Galaga board with no audio. And I told him he could replace some capacitors on the board as they usually have to do with the audio amp section. But he's wondering how he can find that section. The easiest way to find it is to trace back from where the speaker wire pins are. So if you have the speaker wire pins on the edge connector, um, trace the traces on the board back to, you know, whatever section they go to, and that's going to be where your audio amp section is more than likely. So, um, like I said, you want to do that at the board level. You want to trace it back. So start at the actual pin where you would connect the speaker and then move backwards through your board, and eventually you'll get to some parts that are in the audio amp section. So if you're having problems de determining where your audio amp is, that's a good way to do it. So I just want to get that in there for you, Joshua. I hope that helps. Tim, did you have anything else on that? It's kind of near the volume pot. Too, if you have a volume so. pot, yeah. If you have a volume pot on your board, then it would be near that as well. So, Okay, uh, I've got AMV, a Yane fan. He says, I dismantled a Dell LCD screen which had a ground screw connected to the metal casing. I stupidly threw out the metal casing that the ground was connected to. How can I properly ground the board? So, Tim, he should just be able to throw this in under any ground in his cabinet, though, if um, he connects it to the ground on his power supply, or even the floor ground, that should be fine, right? Yeah, it should be fine. So you don't necessarily have to go um, back to the um, to the metal casing, per se, but you can take that all the way. If, you, if, if it's inside an arcade cabinet, of course, you could take that to your power supply, or you could take that to your actual um, your actually floor ground that's on your uh, AC your AC plug. So that's another way to do it as well. So um, hope that helps. Um, if you need additional details with that, let us know. YouTube Punk says he sent in his donation. Thank you, YouTube Punk, for sending in your PayPal donation. We accept all donations and we welcome them and we thank everybody who gives us donations. We appreciate them so much. I will mention that the Regs Regzer Show also threw a donation tonight, so we want to thank him as well. And if you feel like you would like to make a donation, then you can do that by clicking the little dollar sign down below in the live chat if you're here with us live or by going to arcaderepairtips.com slash donate if you'd rather do it that way. So thanks to YouTube Punk and the Regzer Show for donating for this show. We greatly appreciate it, guys. Uh, let's see. Um, AMV, uh, a Yane fan comes, would that ground strip work? Yes, the ground strip would work if that's what you want to do. If you if you have a ground strip distribution block in your cabinet already, you could go to something like that as well. But you got to remember, that ground strip is not grounded unless it's connected to a ground, like a floor ground or a power supply ground. Right, Tim? Yeah. So make sure that it is connected to an actual ground. Otherwise, those screws are... Uh, just because it's a metal plate doesn't mean it's grounded. Right, Tim? No, yeah, you still have to have a you still have to have that connected to a physical ground somewhere, whether that's on the power supply or your plug. And the best way to do that is just take your meter, put on continuity check, and start at the end of your cord where the ground plug is, and you can touch the other grounds. And if you got a continuity or a beep or it ohms out, then you know that you got good grounding all the way through. Or you can also help use that to try to find the break in your grounding. Absolutely. Absolutely, Tim. Great great advice there, and uh, hopefully that helps you out. So, Okay, Tim, let us move on with our outline. And the next one we have is from Mike. And Mike says, Hello, I have a 1943 Battle of Midway monitor that is not working. There is power, but no neck glow. The fuses are good. There's a clicking sound. I need some help, and I'm very frustrated. Any help is appreciated 
appreciated. Thank you, Mike. I don't know. Did I get the very frustrated across real good there, Tim? Very frustrated. Maybe like this. Very. I don't know. But you know how people are. So, Tim, uh, I read this question, and I thought to myself, I better bring in the big guy. So guess who I got? You got Michael. I got Michael. <laughs> so we have a short video from Michael. And, guys, we're going to start doing this. This is what we're going to call Michael's Minute. So every month, Tim, I'm going to send him one of our monitor questions, and he's going to send me back a fantastic video of him answering that question. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to play this video from Michael answering Mike's question about his 1943 arcade monitor. So here we go. Hey everyone, Michael here, coming to you from Florida. Uh, we have a message from Mike, great name. He has some monitor issues. He said uh, his monitor is clicking. He said his fuses are good, no net glow, just got a clicking sound. Um, usually the only thing in a monitor that can click it would be a relay. Um, if you have a chattering relay, that can be caused by low or what we call dirty voltage. Um, and usually that can be solved by replacing some caps around the power supply section. Um, I have seen them do that if something is shorted on the secondary side of it. Um, so he could with a multimeter it'd be real easy just to check to see if he's got any shorts anywhere um, and go from there. I've seen um, monitors chirp and that could be mistaken as a click and it's actually just a chirping sound. Um, and that's usually 100% shorts. Um, usually your hot um, will cause that. And if you have a hot, shorted hot, more than likely your flyback will probably going to be bad in that situation. But this kind of question is kind of hard to answer without knowing exactly which chassis we're talking about and maybe seeing um, a video or uh, some pictures or something to go by a little bit more on it. But I hope this points you in the right direction. And if you still, still can't get it going, just let us know, send us a video or just a little bit more information and we'll do our best to get you going. But until next time, we see you later. Take care, everybody. So, Tim, that was Michael, and I know you didn't get to see the video, but Michael has uh, two, um, it looks like two promotional um, stand-ups for um, Super, uh, Super Mario Maker behind him. Apparently, I talked to him, and he has been collecting uh, video game memorabilia, so um, especially like advertising and cutouts and things like that. So, guys, um, just awesome to have Michael back on the show, Tim. I mean, you know, I... I We've been trying to get him on in some capacity for a while now, but I'm so glad that he's willing to put together these little Michael's Minutes for us and do this kind of stuff. But Tim, uh, let's just go ahead and kind of cover what Michael said here. And if you want to add anything to that, you can, but I'm going to throw it up on the outline scene here. Okay. So like Michael mentioned, sometimes this type of clicking sound could be generated by a chattering relay that's getting low or dirty voltage. In this case, replacing the caps in the power supply section of the chassis should help with that issue. And Tim, you know, obviously that's something that we go to. That's almost like our go-to monitor repair a lot of times. But to hear Michael say it makes me feel better. What about you? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but, um, but the other thing is that monitors will sometimes chirp, which is often mistaken for a, a clicking sound. And Tim, I think you and me have also had this where we've gotten this little chirping sound. Uh, if your monitor yeah. chassis is chirping, it could be caused by short in your hot or your horizontal output transistor and or your flyback. Of course, knowing the make and model of the monitor chassis can help us better diagnose your issue, issue. Please get back to us with that information if you continue to have issues. So um, there you go, Tim. That's, um, that's Mike's question. So I think Mike is actually in the live chat. So if you're here, Mike, hopefully that answers your question tonight. But uh, what a treat to have Michael do that, Tim. And like I said, I think we're going to make this a regular thing. So you guys will be seeing him answering a question once a month. So um, especially particularly hard monitor questions, Tim, which is something that Michael is so good at. Yeah. And Tim, I did talk to Michael and he may, this is not a for sure, but he may start doing monitor repairs again. Oh, so awesome. if you guys are looking for a monitor repair, I'm not promising anything yet because <laughs> it's a maybe yeah. at this point. It may not happen, but um, he may start doing monitor repairs at some point in the future. So um, if he does, we'll let you know here first. Um, so if he does start doing that, but uh, right now, again, it's a definite maybe, I guess we could say. But um, if he does start doing that at some point in the future, we'll definitely let you guys know. So you can send your chassis off to him because, Tim, um, we've seen Michael work and we know he knows his stuff, right? Yeah, most of what we have learned from monitor repair came from Exactly, Mark. and if you've seen any of our videos, you've seen Michael because uh, he's in a lot of the monitor ones, Tim. He is in uh, repairing monitor collapse issues. He is in 
Uh, let's see, what else did we have? Um, golly, so many different videos that we've had Michael in. And so uh, we just want to thank Michael for all that he's that he's contributed to Arcade Repair Tips and all he's going to contribute to him through his new Michael's Minute segment. So thank you again, Michael, for your input. And Mike, hopefully that answers your question. And good luck uh, repairing the monitor on your 1943 arcade cabinet. Okay, Tim, let's see what else we got in the live chat real quick. Um, yeah, Louis said flyback. Flyback, definitely. Um, and that's, you know, that's what uh, Michael was leaning towards with the chirping noise, as we talked about. Uh, Joshua says, you guys are outstanding. God bless you guys for all you've done to me. Thank you for that, Joshua. It means a lot to us. Um, the reason we do it is because we love games and we want everybody to fix theirs. And so hopefully the advice that we've given you has, uh, has uh, helped you and gotten your game going for sure. And uh, if there's anything that we can do, please let us know. Uh, let's see. And YouTube Mike Punk says, Behind you, Mike! You've got Luigi with a hammer! And so, uh, yes, he did have Luigi with a hammer there behind him. Tim, I know you couldn't see it, but uh, it was funny. Yeah. So, Okay, let us continue on with our live show tonight, Tim. And the next question is from Kenny. And Kenny says, Hi, Arcade Repair Tips team. I came across you on YouTube, and I'm happy I found you. Thanks for the incredibly helpful resource you provide. I have a 1988 Nintendo vs. Unisystem Play Choice arcade system. It is currently broken, and I want to open the back panel of the cabinet to see what's going on. I don't have a key, so I am not sure how to unlock it or to open the back panel another way. Do you have any suggestions? Attached are some pics of the cabinet, including a few pictures of the lock. Thank you, Kenny and Tim. I'm going to show these for everybody at home so they can see them. And uh, you guys can see this is a um, standard Nintendo cabinet style play choice. Tim, you used to have one like this, right? Yeah, just like that. Yeah, just like that, in fact. Um, so these are the ones that have been, you know, like I said, they're Nintendo based. So these are not the two screen setups that are often the most common play choice um, cabinets that we see, Tim. This is a single monitor setup with usually a timer LED. Uh, up in the corner to let you know how much time you have on the play choice. And so, Tim, Kenny has this really nice Nintendo play choice, but he doesn't have a key for it, okay? So that presents a problem, especially if you need to work on the game at any time. So what can Kenny do in order to gain access to his Nintendo vers or versus cabinet play choice Unisystem thing? Well, we've had a lot of luck with that particular... In fact, the one we probably broke into the one that we had um, by kind of prying it open from the back and then like using a rubber hammer and hitting the end of the screwdriver to bend the cam enough to let the door fall open. Um, probably have had more luck with Nintendo cabinets doing it just that way, kind of prying it. Now it does damage that wood around there a little bit, but it's pretty negligible, especially if you're not gonna ever lock it back. Uh, if that's a big deal to you, then you probably should watch our video on drilling out a lock and just drill it out and then replace the lock when you're done. Uh, if that's a, but most of the time we can get in there and then we just put screws in the back door just to hold them because we want to be able to get in and out of them a lot easier or we don't want to go we'll have to buy another lock. But most of the time that Nintendo wood is pretty thin. It's almost, a, that back door is a little bit uh, thicker than paneling. It's not very thick at all and you can take a screwdriver and kind of bend that until you hit that cam. Uh, once you get it about a half an inch open, uh, the cam is the bar that moves, that locks it in, and then you can take a hammer and kind of hit the, hit it until you bend it all the way over to where that door will fall open. So Tim, uh, we have a story on that and I don't know if you remember this, when we did the high score save kit in my Donkey Kong, uh, for some reason I misplaced the key. Yeah. And so we actually did have to break into it. And Tim, uh, my Donkey Kong is very similar. It's same style Nintendo cabinet as his play choice is. And we did exactly what you're describing in order to get it open, in order to put that high score save kit in. Guys, we misplace keys all the time. Tim, you know, now what we do is we key everything alike just because it's way easier yeah. than trying to keep keep up with like 10 million keys. And so um, we, all of the games in my game room now all have the same key. They all use the same key. The front doors, the back doors, everything uses the same key because otherwise I wouldn't be able to keep up with it. And so, um, you know, in this particular case, like Tim said, you can actually bend that cam over if, um, and you can see it, Tim, and I actually put it on on the slide here um, because he sent this nice little picture of the back door and the lock, but you can see the cam kind of sticking up through there, through that crack. And so, yeah, if you um, if you can put that flathead screwdriver through there and kind of tap it, then, yeah, you can definitely get it to bend back, like Tim mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the slide here for you guys. 
We have had some luck gaining access to the back door on Nintendo stock cabinets by using a flathead screwdriver and a rubber hammer to move or bend the cam on the lock away from the wood that is holding it in place. If you can't get the cam to move or bend enough to open the door, you might need to drill out the lock in order to gain access. Please see our post and video on replacing a corn door lock for more information on this process. Uh, please be sure that the game is unplugged before attempting either of these methods. And Tim, this, you got to remember, if you're doing a drill on this, you need to be very, very careful because where this lock is situated is very close to the monitor. And so if you drill all the way through, you may end up with some shards uh, around or on the monitor tube or chassis. So be very careful with that. Tim, when we drill locks, a lot of times we don't have to drill all the way through, correct? No, once you start, um, it'll actually, a lot of times, then you can stick a screwdriver in the hole and turn it. Right. Uh, but most of the time, uh, you don't have to go all the way through. It'll kind of fall apart on you. Right, exactly. So, in fact, in this particular case, it would be better not to drill all the way through just because, like we said, you really don't want those metal shards that are coming off the lock to fall on anything electronic inside the cabinet. On front door locks, we don't care as much because a lot of times there's not as many electrical components up in those areas. But when you're dealing with a back door, there's boards, there's power supplies, there's chassis, there's tubes. You don't want metal shards falling on those. So be very careful. Don't drill all the way through the lock, but drill as far as you can um, and see if that cam will fall. And once it falls, you should be in good shape. Tim, anything else for Kenny before we move on? No, um, it's kind of scary how once you do it a couple times, how quick you can break into one. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really, they're really not that secure. But it just takes a little practice, and but it's always good to get your own locks or just to screw them down where you don't have to lock them. Exactly. Um, so I can see why they have locks in the arcade, but for home use only, they should be fine without a lock. Absolutely. And like you mentioned earlier, Tim, a lot of times we'll just put a screw in it just so we can keep the back door on. But you know, we we don't want we don't want to lock it necessarily because if we do that, we may not be able to gain access uh, when we need it. So Kenny, hopefully I answered your question and good luck at getting the back door off your Play Choice cabinet open. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to the live chat real quick. Um, Danny said, I want to ask you, what did you, what did you first, uh, okay, what did you first during monitor repairs when you first start doing it, how you learn how to solder boards really good. Okay, so how do you learn how to solder boards, boards really good? That's a, uh, Tim, this is something that we've talked about in the past. You can get solder, board kits that actually will help you practice soldering. But Tim, a lot of times what we would do is you would just go to a garage sale or to Goodwill and get you an old circuit board or something like that uh, and just practice on that. Um, a lot of electronics from the 80s, Tim, have really big solder pads, which are really good for practicing solder on, soldering on before you go on to a live board, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we did. I remember we took a VCR apart one time or an old laser disc player and we use the inside pad on it to practice on that's a a good way for something somebody's just going to throw away and uh, it gives you a good place to practice there are some kits and stuff you can buy also just to practice or make stuff out of and a lot of that stuff from the 80s tim like i said it has bigger solder points unlike the stuff yeah. nowadays the stuff nowadays has very tiny solder points in fact they're so tiny a lot of times tim we have to use a magnifying glass or something like that to really be able to see what we're doing and so with the 80s stuff, a lot of those solder points are huge. And so for practicing, getting good at it, uh, use older electronics, any kind of older electronic that you can find as your, you know, as a good practice base for it. And it doesn't, I mean, just find some old busted, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a half cracked open TV or what it is. Um, anything like that will work if, you know, if you pull it out of there and you can solder on it. So um, that's, that's probably one of the best ways to practice. But they do have sol learn to solder kits as well on Amazon, and I can link to one of those in the show notes if you're interested in that, uh, that you can order that will also teach you how to solder as well. Jeff says, the cabinet uh, lock can be e easily picked with a fingernail clipper. Don't drill it. Use a fingernail cleaner, file piece. There's a video on YouTube on how to do it and it won't damage the cabinet. There you go, Tim. So uh, yeah, our friend uh, Stan is really good at picking locks. He's a certified locksmith. We've mentioned him before. Um, Tim, I talked to Stan. His birthday was um, uh, on August 1st, and so I actually called him, said happy birthday, and got to see his arcade set up. Yeah, he's very nice. Um, hopefully I get to see him in person someday. But Stan was a locksmith, and he could pick stuff with, um, you know, just whatever you had around basically uh, including yeah. like a nail file so yeah i don't have that much patience i don't think yeah, exactly so drilling is fast easy and it gets the job done right yep uh yep. jeff says just jiggle the file and twist it at the same time it'll eventually turn so there you go 
Uh, Danny says that would be the best way to have your uh, to have your locks all with one key for sure. That's what I recommend. So buy a group of locks, Tim. Um, we ordered ours, I think, from Twisted Quarter back in the day, right? Yeah, I think so. So Twisted Quarter is a great place to do that from. You can order them from a lot of different places, though. And so um, you know, just wherever you order locks from, order a bundle of them and just replace them as you need them. So. YouTube Punk. Has Tim or John ever owned or worked on a Duramold cabinet? Uh, Tim, we have not, but uh, man, Callan, our, one of our uh, one of our friends, man, he used to have a whole slew of them, right? Yeah, he did. So for those who aren't familiar, Duramold cabinets were produced by Williams, and they um, they were for a lot of the Williams games. What all had Duramolds, Tim? I know Bubbles did. Uh, Sinistar, did it have a Duramold mold? Yeah, I think I've seen one in one. I, I think it was dedicated. I can't remember but all of the Dura mold, mold cabinets at the moment, but if you haven't looked them up, uh, do an internet search for those. Uh, it's some really cool cabinets, Tim. But like I said, uh, it was a Williams product, and so the ones you see in Dura molds are almost all Williams games. And so I know that we've seen Bubbles and Sinistar like that. I'm not sure how many others we've seen like that, though. Any more that come to mind, Tim? Uh not offhand, just kind of threw me off guard. I, I'm trying to remember. Since you said those, those are the ones I'm envisioning. Right. Um, maybe somebody in the chat room can, if they have some, they can tell us what other games. Callum used to have like six had. of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't think was Joust ever. I don't think Joust was. Um, trying to think of what other Williams games off the top of my head. It'll come to me. We'll talk about it. Um, if anybody else has any any more Dura molds or has ever owned one, we'd like to know too, because those things were cool. And Tim, they're pretty rare, right? Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I don't know how many of them were actually dedicated, but they're, yeah, you know, it's kind of like something fun to collect, you know. There you go. They didn't really ever bring that much more at auction, but it seemed like that now they probably would. Absolutely. With collectors now, I think you would see it a lot more. So. Yeah. Okay, let us continue on here, Tim, with the live show. And the next question is from another Mike. And he says, hey, guys, I'm new to, to the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. I'm not sure if you guys covered it or not, but I just got a secondhand Pac-Man machine, and I'm looking to restore it for the man cave. Uh, I'm trying to put a new control panel... I, I'm trying to put on a new control panel overlay, and I have no idea how to do it. If this is covered in one of your older episodes on the YouTube channel, which one is it? Thanks a lot, Mike from Washington, D.C. Now, Tim, um, I could have just sent him, uh, you know, a little message back saying, hey, yeah, we've got it, and this is where it is and everything. Right. But I kind of wanted to talk about some some of the control panel overlay um, things that we talk about in that post. Not so much in the video, but in the post, because a lot of people... Um, may not be as familiar with it. But yes, to answer Mike's question, we do have a post and video on replacing a control panel overlay that you should definitely check out. Um, you know, But there are a couple of things, Tim, that I wanted to kind of get out there just so people, um, in case people were interested in doing this. Tim, there has been kind of this movement to, um, to using like a lighter and soaking like an old control panel overlay and lighter fluid and setting it on fire. Yeah. Um, we're not, we're, yeah, exactly. We're not the one, we don't really recommend this as it could cause damage to your control panel, especially if it's wood and can cause unsafe working conditions. Tim, do you have any more thoughts on lighting a control panel overlay on fire? Well, I mean, some of it is just, I guess it's about time consumption. To really do it right, it takes a lot of time. I think the last one we did was at your house. It seemed like it was going to take us forever just to get, and we're pretty anal and we want to get every ounce of the old stuff off and everything. Um, but the method that we use with a heat gun and stuff really seems to work okay. We're doing the same thing. We're applying heat, and but we're scraping it off, not letting it just burn off. Having said that, I haven't actually done that method in so long that um, it's not like I don't unrecommend it. I'm just like, you know, to each his own. If that works for, good for you, it certainly should be a, like on a Pac-Man cat, cat uh, should be a, a metal one, like you said, to make sure there's no wood. And then, uh, to me, you always have the residue smell of the burning and the lighter fluid. Um, but I guess if you paint it afterwards and give it some good time, it'll probably be okay. Yeah, and you know, the biggest thing though, Tim, is safety. Just making sure that, I mean, if you're gonna, I mean, you're soaking something in light, lighter fluid and lighting it on fire. That just doesn't seem very safe to me. I don't think that's an OSHA approved method, Tim. But, um, right. but for those of you guys who may not be under OSHA, it is a method you could use. We don't recommend it, but it's something you should do. Uh, Tim, like you mentioned, heat gun, uh, we use scrapers, WD-40, goo gun, goof off, that kind of stuff to get it off there. Magic eraser 
eraser works really well if it's really stuck on there. But um, but the burning method's not our favorite. But Tim, the other thing I want to mention is you need to buy high quality artwork from a reputable source. And the reason why yeah. is because it makes a huge difference when you're putting it on. If you get cheap artwork it's going to look cheap on the overlay if you get good quality artwork it's going to look really nice and so if you don't mind the cheap look if you just want to throw it on there you think it's going to get beat up or something that's fine but you do get what you pay for when it comes to artwork tim and so make sure that you buy really great artwork it will save you a lot of trouble when you go to put it on the cabinet right yeah well the case in point would be arcade one-ups the first round that came out looked great but they were kind of cheap cheaply ink, ink printed and stuff and they weren't didn't last any time and you notice now they've had to replace a ton of right. them and the better the newer cabinets have better artwork which we told a long time ago you can't can't go cheap on the artwork and stuff especially if it's something you're going to play and if you're looking for places to get high quality artwork we recommend our resources page that's at arcade repair tips.com slash resources and we do have an artwork section under there tim uh, game on graphics is one that we recommend phoenix arcade is there anyone else besides them that you know offhand that it, uh, produces pretty high quality artwork well, I'm looking for some myself, and those are the first two sites that I went. The Game on Graphics is cool because they let you upload your own kind of stuff, and they'll help you make a custom kind of deal. But um, it's hard to beat the quality of um, Phoenix Arcade. And they're always, if you want something as close to the original, probably even better, that's who I would highly recommend. And I know there are other people, since we don't buy a ton of artwork anymore, um, that are probably out there doing just just ask them about the maybe the methods that they do uh, the material that they print on stuff like that and it, it is true a lot of times you get kind of what you pay for especially when it comes to artwork there you go exactly and so um we've got a couple other things um real billy or real hammer billy lee says galloping ghost reproduction sells great arcade art tim can't say enough good things about galloping ghost the arcade, yeah. their artwork, anything involved with them, guys. Um, they've got one of the largest arcades uh, in the world in Illinois. Um, just great stuff out of Galloping Ghost. You can't go wrong with them. Uh, but, yeah, Phoenix Arcade. Oh, here's the thing. Game on Graphics and Phoenix Arcade, Tim, we've been using for over a decade. Maybe two decades, yeah. right? Yeah, so we were using Game on Graphics before they were Game on Graphics, before they changed their right. name. And so, I mean, these places do really high-quality work we really recommend them because we've had the experience with them so oh tim something else while we're talking about resources and vendors that you may want to know is that the real bob roberts is taking orders again wow but it's not bob that's so much it's bob's it's wife now. that's fulfilling most of the orders but if you send an email to him they are fulfilling orders now that's awesome yeah so um like i said bob has kind of stepped out of that i think he's still recovering but i think he's slowly getting back into things but um yeah i uh, somebody posted on one of the groups the other day that the real Bob Roberts .net is back open. So if you guys are looking for uh, any parts, you can always get them from Bob. He has always had high quality stuff. Tim, we've recommended Bob since we started this thing, and we're going to continue to recommend him. So if you're looking for parts, the real Bob Roberts .net is back open. Highly recommend it. So uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, Thisoldgame.com. Heard a lot of good things about them, Tim. I don't think either one of us have used them personally, but still, I've heard that they have really good artwork. So, okay, is that everybody? Okay. Um, Blake says there's a video of a guy um, using O'Reilly brake fluid aerosol to wipe black cabinet paint right off. So, huh. um, which is interesting because, Tim, usually we use citrus strip or something like that. So I'm going to have to check out this video for sure. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, Danny says, I've been having problems with older go golden tea boards before I bought them used and work uh, and i keep having issues burning up in the same spot and i've checked my wiring connections and they are fine um danny have you checked your power supply to make sure it's not too high i mean that would be my thing tim any other thoughts yeah or it's not grounded properly you know something is causing uh that issue uh you're getting too much somewhere you know or it's not grounded properly yeah typically um yeah typically um that is uh like i said that's uh you know, you'd have something uh, for it to be burning up like that. I mean, typically it'd be a power supply issue. And Tim, this is something that's really important is that you can have your 5 volts dialed in and your 12 volts can be wrong, right? Correct. And so be sure, yeah, off. be sure that you have both your 5 and your 12 dialed in because I know a lot of people will just go off the 5 and think, okay, I'm getting 5 volts, I'm okay. But just because you're getting the 5 doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the 12. Tim, we've had power supplies where we get 5 volts on the 5 volts line, we get 14 on the 12, right? 
Yeah. And so um, check your power supply really good there, Danny. Make sure that you're okay on there. Do check your wiring and make sure that everything's uh, good there. He did say his wiring was good. And so, Tim, that really only leaves the power supply at that at that point because there's really nothing else to get nothing else in there right yeah i would i would heavily look into that area sounds good um let's see regzer show says he uses game on graphics a lot so he has a good like i said he has a good relationship with them um let's see danny says maybe it's because it's before they went to hard drive i don't know would be better to run a cooling fan above the board actually the ones before they went to hard drive are usually more reliable than the ones with the hard drives in my i mean in our experience right tim yeah, I agree. So, um, but I don't know if the wiring is the same or not. So, I mean, that'd be the question. So, anyway, uh, but fans always help. We're we're a big proponent of using fans in your game. Period. Right. And we shot a. I think we did a video. We talked about it before having not just a fan blowing in, but one blowing in, one blowing out, and letting that air really circulate in there. Exactly. Blowing in from the bottom, blowing out from the top, guys. Um, you got to remember that cool, cool air falls, hot air rises. So, you know, if you can blow in from the bottom, blow out from the top, that get that air circulating through your cabinet, it really does make a difference. Uh, Danny asks, have you ever been to Galloping Ghost? No, but we do have a pretty good relationship with Doc Mac, Tim. Back when we first got started and before they had the big arcade, um, they were making their, um, whatever that arcade game is, Dark Presence, and they actually linked to uh, our website saying they learned a lot from us. So uh, we want to thank uh, the guys at Galloping Ghost and Doc Mac and all those guys because, I mean, I tell you what, they have one heck of an arcade. And if you're in, the, if you're in that Illinois area around there, you, you just have to stop and check it out. You will not be disappointed. Uh, let's see. AMV again, fan. I'll be building and selling cabs for MAME in the next few months, and there is a limited but willing market in East Canada. I will get a CNC uh, to save time and cut the cabs. Your opinion if CNC is worth it? So, if you're going to be doing a lot of games, Tim, then a CNC mill is definitely worth it. Um, oh, sure. But, man, it is expensive, and so it is an investment for you if you're going to be building cabinets. But, Tim, like he mentioned, there is a demand for cabinets, and so a CNC machine. Uh, can definitely help you crank up those cabinets very quickly, which is very nice. The programming on CNC mills is pretty easy. Tim, I've done that in the past. Uh, you can pretty much cut whatever you want to with it. And um, if you're pretty good at, with AutoCAD, you can drop something in AutoCAD and then have the mill cut it instantly. It's super simple. So, um, you know, just really great stuff. If there's a market for it and you think you can recoup your investment, I'd say go for it, right, Tim? Yeah, and a lot of those files are available online, too. Yeah already so that you can just program them right in there and do the cutting you just need the machine exactly so um yeah danny says he watched a video about galloping ghost on john's arcade channel and would love to go i would love to go um and uh, so we got to make the trip someday uh you know to see doc tim at some point definitely want to go and and see all the games that they have and just talk with him because he seems like a super cool guy the whole place seems just like just like it's right up our alley. So um, hopefully once all this mess is behind us, we can get back to some, doing stuff like that. So, Okay, Tim, it looks like we have uh, one from Nick here, so I'm going to go ahead and move to that one. Hi there. I recently got a Dance Dance Revolution arcade cabinet, and I noticed that any heavy vibration will cause the signal to go out on the monitor and then come back after about a second. Something that looks like a choke coil spool of copper about the size of my pinky nail has come undone and slightly unwound. I wound it back up and re-glued it to the board, but the same problem still exists. I, I double-checked all the connections on the board after the machine was off and discharging, and discharging the monitor. Does this sound like anything obvious, or should I send my chassis out for repair? So, Tim, this is a common problem. Golly, we've had this on who yeah. knows how many cabinets over the years. Um, but what would you recommend for Nick here? Basically, I mean, he, he's fine, but he starts dancing on it. All of a sudden, he'll cut out for a second and come back in. Well, anytime a game goes out and off and on like that, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, uh, we start suspecting cold solder joints. And especially games that have a lot of movement or a lot of bounce and the vibration from playing the game and stuff. So where the pins go into the from the uh, board uh, would be a great place to start make sure and we we've mentioned this several times before but every time michael ever repairs uh, a chassis for us first thing you do is you turn it over and just start touching up solder joints everywhere so that's a very common problem something that happens quite a bit and but it's also easily fixed and it's usually either a um, yeah, a cold solder joint or 
a uh, broken wire or something real simple. Absolutely. So, I mean, and guys, like I said, we've seen this in numerous games. We've seen it in Dance Dance Revolutions. We've seen it in Golden Tees. We've seen it in driving games. Uh, Tim, any game that has a lot of movement like this, it's very common that um, that you'll have this kind of uh, cut in and out on the monitor for a sec. And Tim, it is almost always a cold solder joint. I can't tell you how many times uh, we've seen this. And like you mentioned, Tim, on the input pins in particular, it seems like it's more common there than anywhere else, right? Yeah, very common. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and throw this up real quick. Uh, so we've had this exact problem on numerous occasions here, Nick, and almost every single time had to do with a cold, cracked, or broken solder joint or a bad connection to the monitor chassis. Now, Tim, the only reason we didn't mention that as much is because he did say that he went through the connections and everything looked good. But, Nick, don't let that fool you. Check the continuity to those wires and make sure that you're getting a good connection because just because it looks good doesn't mean it is. Right, Tim? Yeah. So, um, but this is... You can't trust your eyes. you got to really... Uh, either look at it through a microscope, but even then, just touch it up. It doesn't take long. That's right. This issue is incredibly common on games that feature a lot of physical movement or activity, such as Dance Dance Revolution. Tim, I mentioned uh, Golden Tee. It seems like we saw this issue a lot on Golden Tee games. Uh, the other one yeah. would be driving games, because driving games get a lot of movement, Tim. People really get into those driving games. They kind of jerk that steering wheel around, and it definitely uh, causes some strife within the arcade cabinet when you do that. So, try removing the monitor chassis and checking the input wires and pins. Touch up the solder on each input pin to ensure that the connection is being made to the board. And then touch up any cold, cracked, or broken solder joints on the rest of the chassis as well. And then once you do that, Nick, hopefully that will restore all of your issues and you won't have that split-second cutout that you're getting. But like, I, like Tim mentioned, super common, cold solder joint. Because all it takes, Tim, is a little bit of movement and that pin just doesn't get separates from the solder just for a second and then all of a sudden you don't have a picture anymore right yeah so there you go so uh nick hopefully answers your question now tim i think i heard back from nick and he said he already sent the chassis off for repair so i'm curious nick uh once you get it back let us know what they found because i mean it's possible you could have component failure as well it's just in our experience we've seen a lot more cold cracked solder joints than we have component failure with this issue so uh nick hopefully answers your question and let us know how the repair on your dance dance revolution monitor goes Okay, Tim, and now we have some questions from YouTube. Oh, um, Danny says we need to take a road trip when uh, road trip show when everything is better. Uh, you know, that would be yeah. great. I, Tim, I feel like I need to, to make like 100 road trips to make up for all of this time I've been inside. So yeah, um, we'll, sure. we'll see about that. Maybe at some point we can do that. But, Tim, we're up to our questions from YouTube where we kind of rapid fire some of the questions that we've gotten over the last month. And so, Tim, we have okay. three YouTube questions that we're going to answer here in rapid fire order. So we'll go over those, and then we'll get to them one by one. And so, Tim, the first one is from Justin, and he says, should I disconnect the DC output on a power supply completely before plugging in and testing? It will boot if I do not. So if he does not unhook disconnect it, it will boot. Lou says, if I bought a really nice JAMA harness for a Street Fighter II Championship Edition board, will it eliminate the need for a CPS-1 kick harness? And then Samuel says, whenever I try to press down on the joystick, it doesn't respond anymore. This stopped working after I opened the control panel just to see if everything looked in order. So if you can please tell me what the problem is and how to solve it, that would be greatly appreciated. So Tim, we have Justin who, who's wondering, should he disconnect his DC output before testing his um, voltage? Then we have Lou who wonders if he still needs a kick harness if he has a really nice JAMA harness. And then we have Samuel who is having joystick trouble and just can't get that darn down direction to work anymore after opening up the panel. So Tim, let's take these one by one rapid fire. Justin, do I have to disconnect the DC voltage in order to check the power supply? No, you don't have to at all. You can check it with it completely wired up. In fact, that's the way we do it most of the time when we get a game, Tim. If we're just getting it for troubleshooting, the very first thing we do is turn it on and check the power supply. We don't disconnect anything, right? No. Now, with that said, if you have the DC connected up when you get the cabinet, go ahead and see if the DC voltage is good at the board too, right, Tim? Correct. Because that'll help you a lot with your troubleshooting. So if you're get, you know, if you're you've already got your DC, uh, your switching power supply hooked up, DC voltage is going to your board. Check the DC voltage at the board as well. Nice time to check it if you've got everything already hooked up. So what do you think about Lou? Um, he's got a nice JAMA harness. Does he still need a kick harness if he's going to if he's going to wire up a CPS one game like Street Fighter two? Yeah, you have to have one because there's not the main even the best JAMA harness. Uh, pin, their pinouts are missing for that. Exactly. And uh, Tim, I can put it real simple for him. No kick harness, no kick. 
Right. That's why it's called the kick harness. Uh, that's why we refer to it as the kick harness, is because on Street Fighter 2, all the kick buttons are on the kick harness. So without the kick, without the kick harness, no kick, Lou. So there you go. And then Samuel. So down is not working after he opened up the control panel. What's going on, Tim? Well, it's possible one of the terminals is not on or in the wrong place. Uh, most of the time, though, it's a wiring issue or something. We talked about that before. Uh, but check the connections is what you got to start with. Absolutely. So, Tim, let's go ahead and show the uh, answers that you gave here. And so, uh, Justin, so if the DC voltage is already hooked up in your cabinet, just go ahead and test the power supply as it is. That's what we do, Tim. You do not need to disconnect it to check the voltage. You can check the voltage as it is with it hooked up. And if you're going to do that, go ahead and check that voltage at the board level as well to make sure that you're getting good voltage there. Um, Lou, unfortunately you will still need a CPS-1 kick harness. The main JAMA pinout for this board, board does not include a place for you to connect the kick buttons. So like I mentioned, no kick harness, no kick. So you gotta have the kick harness on there in order to get those. So even the nicest JAMA harness on a CPS-1 game, you're still gonna need the kick harness to do that. And then Samuel, it's possible that one of the terminals on the on the down, or the terminal on the down direction joystick uh, switch came off when you opened it. It could have been either the ground terminal or it could have been the activation terminal for down. Uh, check the connections and see what you find when you open it back up. Tim, it is super common, you know this, that when you open up a control panel, one of the terminals comes undone or a wire comes out of the terminal or whatever the case may be. Um, because when you reach up in there with your hand to unlatch it, a lot of times you will catch some wires or when you physically open and close it, some of those wires will catch. And so it's there's a little trick to making sure that you don't snag any wires when you're doing that. And, it, and it's just you have to be very careful when you're putting it all together, right, Tim? Yeah. So there you go. So check those connections, Samuel, and see what you find. Tim, anything else on these three questions before we move on? No, we can move on. Okay, sounds good. So Justin, Lou, and Samuel, hopefully that answers y'all's questions, and good luck with all of your repairs, and let us know how everything is doing. So Tim, I'm going to go over to the live chat real quick. Um, Overbuilt Automotive says, question, I bought an early 80s pole position to sit down um, about a, or nine months ago. Works, but the screen image is shrunken in top and bottom images. It's squeezed in. So, Tim, it's uh, squeezed this way. So what do you think is going on with this yeah. pole position? Well, it could be an adjustment, but more likely is it's starting to have vertical collapse. Exactly. Or vertical collapse, and it, it needs to have a chassis repair. Right, so you're, you're, getting, you're starting to lose your vertical a little bit here, Overbelt Automotive. Um, so we do, have, um, we do have a video and post on repairing monitor collapse issues. Tim, if you see a little bit of fold all over, then it may just be some caps in the vertical section, correct? Hopefully. But if you're if it's if it continues to collapse down, then you may have to replace the vertical IC or other things as well, yeah. correct? Exactly. And another thing with vertical guys is make sure that your B plus voltage is dialed in on your monitor chassis because if your B plus voltage is low, sometimes you will have picture size issues. So those are the things you want to check. Check all of the caps in the vertical section. Check the vertical IC and then make sure your B plus voltage on the chassis is dialed into what it's supposed to be. If you check those things, um, overbuilt automotive, then you should be in good shape. Louis does say, did you try the adjustments? Or not Louis, excuse me. YouTube Punk says, have you tried the adjustments? He does say yes. So right. Tim, he has tried as much as he has adjustment wise, but still can't get it right, more than likely an issue with the chassis, correct? Yeah, it's starting to go out. It's time to give it a repair. There you go. So Overbell Automotive hopefully answers your question. Good luck uh, restoring that vertical on that pole position two sit down cabinet. Tim, do you have a pole position one or a pole position two sit down? It was one, right? One. Yeah. I remember we had one of those. Those are really cool cabinet, Tim, and I remember we were having a party and it was about, I don't know, three hours before the par party, we lost power because we had overloaded a breaker and we booted that thing back up and it didn't boot. I remember that. No. <laughs> ah, pole position. So, but anyway, there's a lot of things you can do to bulletproof pole position boards. And so uh, uh, we can send you some links on that kind of stuff, um, Overbuilt Automotive, if you're interested in it. But uh, we would recommend doing some bulletproofing for sure. Correct, Tim? Yeah, I highly recommend it if you want to keep it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Tim, so you got your tech tips for this month. Now, Tim, this isn't really a tech tip, but we know that a lot of um, arcades are starting to open back up now that we're starting to relax some of the COVID-19 uh, regulation, excuse me, in some states. And so for this tech tip, it, it looks like we're just going to give some uh, sanitary I'm tips on... I'm having, I'm having, I'm oh, having trouble what is that? connecting to the network. Oh. Please try again <laughs> later. Oh, that's, uh, that's Alexa there. There you go, guys. But... Um, <laughs> But anyway, we know that, um, you know, obviously arcades are opening up, and so there are things that are happening that, uh, you know, 
we need to keep our arcades clean. We need to keep them sanitized. And so, Tim, this tech tip is basically you giving some tips on how people can do that, correct? Yeah. Uh, we thought that it, not only is it needed because of arcades opening, or maybe you're an arcade owner, or maybe your own game room. You're wondering how, if you're going to have a party or you have some kids over or something, how can you keep them as sterile uh, as, or sanitized as possible? And uh, I think that that's going to be the key is even if these arcades are open, like Chuck E. Cheese is back open and stuff like that, um, they still are going to be required or people are going to be worried about people touching surfaces and other people come behind them. So what can you do to kind of best sanitize and keep germs uh, and especially COVID-19 off of them? Exactly. So, Tim, tell us about some of the things. Now, I put together this slide based on the stuff that you told us. So, tell us about some of these different products that people can use. Now, Tim, obviously, most people know about, like, Lysol and bleach. But, you know, the thing about bleach, right, is it can cause some damage, right, if they're not careful. Yeah, bleach, just like it gets on your clothes, it can damage a game, like the artwork or the uh, control panel. You can discolor it. Bleach products are awesome, though, for killing germs and viruses. So one thing that we want to recommend is there you, you need to clean it first. In other words, your games, you can't just go around spraying Lysol on them and call them sanitized. They actually do need to be cleaned first. So getting the old dirt and grime and things out, especially like a kitty ride or something, I highly recommend maybe using like OxyClean, which has bleach in it, but it will, and it also has a disinfectant, but it will not uh, do as much damage and you could just do a general or soap and water general soap and water uh, actually kills a lot of germs and things but after that that doesn't going to kill everything and uh, you can't uh, put a mask on your game so you've got to be able to clean it a little further and that's why we want to it's a slide up, up right now yeah John. everybody can see it we got the slide up we want to talk about uh steramine tablets i'm just for the money, I guess you could say, because if you use a can of Lysol, let's say a Chuck E. Cheese, and you clean 60 to 100 games, you go through a can every couple hours, and that would get really expensive. But Steramine tablets is something that you can buy at Sam's, I know for sure. And what you do is you put, drop them, kind of like Alka Seltzer or Tums, a big drop. You put it into a water, just regular water bottle. Uh, and then you can spray it and make like a spray. It kind of looks like Windex, except for when it's done, it's a little bit bluer if you mixed it right. And then that will kill COVID-19 and a lot of other uh, serious type of uh, viruses on surface and stuff, but it also has hardly any smell at all. And uh, so we want to highly recommend but you can easily spray down and wipe a game within seconds, uh, the places that people touch, and you can go into the next game. It will, you know, it's not 100% guaranteed, John, but it definitely is probably better than we were doing. The next thing we talk about is instead of reusing a towel, like a terry cloth towel, which is what we normally would use, um, that, does, that actually will soak up viruses and keep them, and you actually can spread it. Uh, use a paper towel, or something that you can actually, after wiping down, you just throw it in the trash. Or let's say the virus gets onto the paper towel, at least you're throwing it in the trash afterwards. And it's not just going to spread it to the next surface that you clean. So we highly recommend not using the terry cloth towels and things like that, but paper towels. And of course, hand wipes, sanitizer, all that stuff helps, but uh, it does have to have a high they were talking about the other day, a lot of sanitizer it doesn't have a lot of alcohol in it or enough. So you're not really doing any good. Uh, this stuff has enough and it will kill the viruses and stuff. So it's one thing that I think we would recommend. If you've never checked out, even for your house, uh, we figured out that one bottle should last you. And what was the price on it, John? Was just a $4 or something? It was five, yeah, it was $5 it? for an entire bottle that had like 40 tablets in it. So, so that would last like you, uh, you know, a month or longer just from one bottle. So think about that cost compared to one can of Lysol or something. It's very cost effective 
and something we're going to highly recommend during this time. Yeah, and Tim, I was not familiar with Steramine until you sent this to me. And, you know, the thing right now, guys, is getting Lysol is pretty impossible. Um, I I was able to get some Lysol wipes, but I had a, like an, a standing order with Amazon for like four months before they actually shipped. And that only sent me like four bottles of Lysol wipes, you know. And if I was an arcade and I was going through this stuff quickly, it'd be very difficult to keep Lysol products on hand. Plus, Lysol is expensive, right, Tim? Yeah, and bleach, I mean, bleach you can find, but bleach may cause damage and discoloration to some of your artwork or the cabinets or stuff like that. So you really don't want to use bleach unless you just absolutely have to. Um, but the Steramine tablets are a sanitizer, like what you get with Lysol, and very cheap, very readily available. And and like you said, Tim, can really, and is, I think in um, on some of the websites I read, Tim, actually has been shown in studies to kill coronavirus. So, um, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that's great. I mean, something that's cheap, cost-effective, and can clean games very uh, very quickly. And, yeah, you were mentioning, like, a whole spray bottle would probably last you an entire day. So, I mean, you're going through two tablets a day, you get, like, a pack of, I forget how many in that in that $5 bottle. But, yeah, I think we were thinking it was going to last for 60 or 75 days. So Yeah, and, then, and just think about that for that cost. So, if, if you haven't heard of it, it's still pretty readily available right now. Or maybe you work at arcade, you might want to bring that uh, to your manager's attention or something. I think it works great. We use it a lot, and uh, I think it, I think it's a good product. And uh, Things be working so far, hopefully. Yeah. Now the paper towels uh, you mentioned, Tim. The biggest thing is, I think after, you know you really need to clean. You really need to throw them away after you clean one game. Don't eat, just yeah. because it's um, a paper towel. Don't think that you can clean multiple games with the same paper towel. You really need to wipe down one game with a set of paper towels and throw those in the trash. Get brand new paper towels for the next game because you don't want to spread the virus to multiple cabinets. Correct. Correct. Kind of like wearing gloves. They protect you, the person wearing them, but if you're touching surfaces and touching other surfaces, you're really just spreading it around if you're wearing gloves and not washing uh, your hands. Correct. So be sure if you're using paper towels that you wipe down each individual game with a set of paper towels and then throws in the trash before doing another game. And Tim, we mentioned hand wipes and sanitizer and making sure, like you mentioned, Tim, that you have high-grade sanitizer um, that is good. Tim, some of the san sanitizer has also... Um, uh, been poisoning people. I don't know if you've seen that, Tim, where um, no, the, um, the amount of a certain type of alcohol is actually having a negative effect. So guys, get your sanitizer from reputable sellers and reputable places. Uh, you know, don't don't just buy from, you know, Joe Blow sanitizer um, or hand sanitizer or whatever. Um, you know, see if you can get some from Target. And Tim, when I go out to stores, um, which is rare, but I do, I do see, you know, the, um, the antibacterial gel out there and things. So, so you can get it. I'm just saying it's out there, so um, you know, and encourage your customers to use them after they after they play a game to prevent the spread to other cabinets. Sounds good, Tim. Anything else before we move on? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, I think that's a really good tech tip, especially for the times that we're currently living in, Tim, because there's a lot of arcades that are opening now, and uh, with the opening of arcades, we know that uh, you know the virus has not gone away, even though we are opening arcades. So we want to be cautious. Those who have arcades, uh, you want to do your best to sanitize everything to make sure that your customers don't get sick. So, Tim, I think great tech tip, and uh, thank you for for giving us that one this month. Well, so, there you go. Uh, and uh, yeah, Joshua, I. He, he was the one that's having the problem with the audio amp on his um, Galga Mispack board. Yeah, we're going to recommend, and there's some people who do that kind of repair. Uh, Raymond at Arcade Components could actually diagnose that, arcadecomponents.com. So you may want to contact him uh, because here's the deal. I could replace the capacitors, but there could be something else going on, and I don't have a scope or anything to tell, tell you what's going on, Joshua. So your best bet is to send to somebody who does that board level repair stuff already, like I said, like our friend Raymond at arcadecomponents.com. So you may look, look him up and see how much he would charge to uh, to take a look at your board and uh, get it back to you. So if you don't feel doing, comfortable doing that yourself, you see, if you replace the caps and it doesn't work, then you can always send it off too. So, I mean, there's nothing nothing wrong with trying it yourself first and then if it doesn't work, shipping it off to someone, right, Tim? Yeah. So there you go. Okay, Tim. Well, let's go ahead and get into the discussion portion for this episode. And Tim, I don't know if you saw this, but it made uh, headlines everywhere. Hundreds of teens go on a chaotic rampage at Memphis Putt-Putt Center, New York Post. 
So a Tennessee mini golf center erupted in chaos Saturday night when 300 to 400 teenagers began terrorizing staffers and smashing up the premises because the game machines ate their cash. The riotous scene was caught on camera by an alarmed bystander and showed the violent teens going berserk to throw various heavy objects at staff because they didn't issue the kids a refund. It was game over for the teams when police police showed up and issued a juvenile summons for disorderly conduct. Now, Tim, that was the story from the New York Post, but I don't know if, um, I don't know if you looked at the actual Facebook page for the Putt-Putt Center in Memphis that this happened to, but it looks like the New York Post may have had some fake news going on. So, um, cause, okay. cause here's the actual <laughs> update from Golf and Games Family Park in from their Facebook page, Tim. This is from the source. Okay. And they said adhering to COVID guidelines, 100 people are allowed inside the building. Three to 400 people were never inside the building at a given time. Individuals decide to jump the line and get on the go-kart ride while another ride was in progress. While security and other team members tried to get the queue line in order, the decision was made to suspend ticket sales in an effort to be sure everyone got their appropriate number of rides. Within two to three minutes, several individuals engaged in a verbal confrontation before being separated by security and staff members. At this time, the decision was made to suspend operations for the evening. As the staff prepared for refunds, individuals pushed the manager and started screaming and yelling about their refund. To protect the staff and guests, it was announced no refunds would be given. Golf and Games will continue to work with those that want a refund. So, Tim, that's a much different story than the New York Post. The sensationalization, yeah. man, it happens all the time, doesn't it? It and you know, uh, people, you know, we talk about quote unquote fake news, Tim. But really, what it is is sometimes news outlets sensationalize the news to get the headline bigger, right? And I think that's what the New York Post did here, because I, I tend to believe the actual place where it happened over just a random news story. What about you? I think so. I, I'm sure that they uh, wanted to downplay it some themselves too, but it makes more sense what they said happened than just somebody losing their mind over $4 or something. Right, exactly. It doesn't seem, based on their description, that it had anything to do with the arcade machines, okay? It sounds like what happened is they sell tickets to, like, go-kart rides and stuff. And so something got, they got a little rowdy on the go-kart ride. And so, you know, they, they were kind of like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to stop ticket sales for a little bit just to make sure everybody who's got tickets gets to play. And then, you know, there were some confrontations and then they're like, well, we're just going to, we're just going to close down because we don't want to deal with this. And then they're going to give refunds and they start fighting and that's kind of how it all sparked. So it wasn't necessarily on the games. But Tim, my question to you is what if it was the games? How would you handle that? And so Tim, we're not going to do a debate tonight, but instead we're going to do a little bit of a discussion on how would you, because Tim, you've been a general manager and you've had experience in this field. So I think it'd be interesting to to find out your input on this. How would you handle a situation similar to the one that happened at the golfing games in Memphis, Tennessee? Now, Tim, we have the live chat here as well. So if you guys in the live chat would like to uh, chime in on this subject, we'd love to get your opinions as well. But Tim, you have a wealth of experience in the amusement industry, working at Chuck E. Cheese, Mr. Gaddy's, and other places over your tenure. And so, Tim, we want to get your input. And so I'm going to go ahead and put this up on the screen. How would you handle a situation? Let's say, let's say it was the arcade games that weren't given the re, or um, that uh, they went berserk over because it ate their money and they didn't get refunds or whatever. How would you handle a situation similar to that if it happened at your establishment? So, Tim, I'm going to let you talk. We're going to let the live chat chime in on this as well. But um, what, as a manager, Tim, what would you do in order to help or in order to control this kind of situation? Well, I think we, as a customer. I've been to places where a game took my money or it didn't operate fully. Most of 99% of the time, you just give the refund. You don't worry about the cost. Um, you don't want to upset somebody or lose $100 over a dollar or $2 or $10. But at the same time, uh, Chuck E. Cheese had a term. Uh, they called everybody guests. Okay, and I will, I'll put it this way. Let's say you come over to my house, I invite you over, John, you're going to come over and play some games at my house. You're my guest. I'm going to clean up the game room, I want to make sure everything's working. I'm going to do everything I can. I'll, you know, we'll pick up the dirty laundry, all that stuff, because you're a guest and I want you to feel welcome and to have a good time. But if you come in and start throwing stuff, and threatening me, uh, you're no longer a guest at that point. You have become an intruder and a robber. And that's where you don't get, I don't, nobody gets paid enough to deal with that stuff. 
So it's best to call the authorities, have them come out, have them take care of the situation. Uh, you don't really have a lot of control there, except for maybe just turning off the power or something, but you're just going to incite people more. At some point, you can apologize and all that, but when, when things get out of hand, um, that's what you have to do. And what we've had to do before is just call the police and uh, have them come and sort it out or help us. Um, I def definitely uh, don't want to get a political job, but that's what police are for. They're police peacekeepers, and their job is to do that and to help you in those situations. Um, so I would definitely call the police the second that anybody uh, threatened one of my cast members or started to get violent or threw anything something like that you just cannot tolerate that so um, did you see the video of the young woman uh, that awesome. picked up the the little post and damaged all the plexiglass and all that kind of stuff did you see yeah, it? I, I actually thought the manager or at least the cast member handled it pretty well under circumstances like I said once you go into throwing stuff at me I mean this is Texas we are talking about concealed carry <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of stuff we don't put up with, and that would be one of them. I'll give you your money back and stuff, but you're going to start tearing up the establishment or causing bodily harm to me or one of my friends or cast members. Um, then we're definitely going to call the cops, but it may be too late by the cops get there, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's why I'm asking. So, like, as a manager, let's say that they do start throwing this stuff. Is there any kind of action that you feel like you can take in order to protect your staff? Do you just tell them to go to the back, or do you let them sit there? Yeah, what do you do? I would definitely pull the staff out of the out of the front area, pull the staff into the back, into a safe place. Um, literally, um, you know, an office or something. They could go in the door and shut the door. Uh, I would never want my staff to be in any kind of danger like that because it could take several minutes for the police to get there. Uh, fortunately, everything is caught on camera. Uh, I, in the time that we live in, I hope that at least some of them are brought to justice and uh, you know the perpetrators that did this stuff, uh, they should be held accountable for the damages and stuff. But no damage, no gain, no nothing is worth somebody's life or somebody getting uh, seriously injured. So my advice would be to pull the staff out as quick as possible. Tell them, go to the back, whatever. We're shutting this down. Uh, we're closed. They could leave out the back door if they needed to, uh, to be safe. I'm sure there's some good hiding spots. Everybody knows if you're on the inside. Um, but I definitely would uh, encourage them to get out of the way and uh and not confront people that were at that point absolutely i mean tim i think as a manager your utmost importance should be the safety of your staff and so pulling your staff at that point does seem like probably the smart thing to do um you know tim obviously um i've never had to deal with anything like this um, i worked retail for a while we had irate customers but it was never um to the point of violence like this we had bomb threats and things but um yeah. never to the point of violence like this and so i and now i've worked um day after Thanksgiving, Tim, and I can tell you it was crazy. But even in a mob like that, Tim, you'd be surprised how ruly everything went considering how many people were around. So uh, usually usually you don't have this kind of physical uh, physical violence, Tim, like we saw in this video. But obviously uh, this got out of hand, and I, I think as a manager, your best, basically your best, the best thing you can do is just try to keep your staff, staff safe and call the police, correct? Yeah. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah. You got, you got to try to keep it from getting to that point, and that may be stepping in. Um, a lot of times just approaching people, hey, you know, we had the same problem at, at Chuck E. Cheese sometimes. People would cut in front of people or whatever, just saying, hey, look, you know, let's take turns, let's share. But some people don't listen, you know, and uh, it's sad that that's the world we live in, that uh, some people behave in such manners. Uh, no matter who they're associated with or whatever, you know, I I've seen all walks of life people um, that that can do that can, it can turn out get out of hand really quick. So you have to be thinking quick immediately. Though, uh, you know, there was a water burger here in town the other day. Somebody shot like ten or twelve times. Um, you know, I definitely don't want to confront those people. I want to get my staff in as safest place possible. 
and if necessary, defend myself if possible. Absolutely. I think that would be every bit of a justified in defending yourself. There's no sense in you being hurt either. Absolutely, Tim. So let's go to the live chat and see what people said. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see what I got here. Overbuilt Automotive says, "My." Um, let's see. You try to uh, YouTube Punk says you try to stop it before it happens, but once it's chaos, not sure what you can do. And Overbuilt Automotive says smoke makes folks move quickly. So there you go. Um, but um, yeah, it's just it's crazy. I mean, you know, and Tim, I think a lot of this has to do with kind of being cooped up like we all have been with um, COVID and, you know, having to stay home and not being able to get out. I think it is making some folks a little crazy. So um, it seems like we're seeing more of these incidents happen more recently than we have in the past. Is that just me? Yeah. Have, have you heard of the, um, there, there's one way that they're talking about patrolling like teenagers like that. Have you heard of the high pitch that they can't, that I can't hear because of my age or I, it doesn't bother me? No, I haven't. And, Play it, and a teenager will drive them crazy. It hurts their ears and stuff. That's one self-defense. You can actually go over an intercom and hit this, and it makes a pitch that most are, as you get older, you lose that high, high pitch sound, but teenagers can hear it, and it hurts their ears to the point where most of them will leave right away. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. That's kind of a, a safe way to disperse a crowd. Uh, if you're older and it doesn't bother you, like it doesn't bother me much. But, <laughs> to me, rock uh, concerts for you and me, Tim. Guys, my teenagers and my dogs crazy. So. There you go. Well, um, if you guys are watching this after the fact, please chime in the comments or uh, reply to us on Twitter or Facebook. Let us know what you would do if you were the manager in that particular situation. Tim gave you his advice, but what do you think about his advice? Let us know, and uh, we look forward to having some more discussion with you in the future. So, uh, Tim, thank you for your input on that. Tim's going to eat a little dinner real quick. So, what well, we got there? Spaghetti? I'm sorry, guys. Oh, I understand. Like I said, you were, <laughs> you were in such a hurry to get back. I know you didn't have time to eat, so... I haven't eaten all day since 6 a.m. Golly, they need to give you something. You work at a freaking food establishment. <laughs> That's what my wife says, but you don't understand. It's like when the kitchen is already pressed and, you're, and then you're like, oh, and by the way, can you make me something too? You know? There you go. Well, I, I'm telling you, you need to you need to score some of those tacos or something. I love those tacos at Dairy Queen. That's my <laughs> favorite. But anyway, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. We have... Um, YouTube Punk says, what song were you talking about? You're not talking about a song. You're talking about, a, like, a tone, right? Yeah, I'll have to do, maybe post, send you a link to it or something. There's a tone that people are using in amusement areas and stuff like this that uh, you can't hear. It's a real high-pitched sound. Uh, I know there's a YouTube video on it, and it's fun to play with your kids to see. From what I, from what I understand... It literally will make their head hurt, and they can't stand it. It's like a dog whistle. Blake says, well, well I need one of those anti-teenager sirens to wear all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. But uh, I don't. Uh, if you find it, let us know. I think maybe maybe uh, some of our live chat will do some research on it. I'm curious. So. Okay. okay, let us go on with our discussion here, Tim. And the next one, you sent this article to me, and I posted it on our Facebook page, Tim, but I thought it was interesting. This actually came from the Asia-Pacific um, uh I guess, uh, area of the Washington Post. It was not a local story per se, not a U.S. story, but I thought it was interesting because the company is actually, I think, from the U.K., Tim, that this is affecting. But um, this spring, Dave Watson, general manager of Jolly Roger Amusement Rides Limited, flew to Dallas to present Chuck E. Cheese with his new coin-operated children's ride. The machine, which Watson said cost his company about $64,000 to develop, features a miniature train chugging around a grinning likeness of, of the mouse mascot. Then the pandemic shutdowns hit along with the bankruptcy filings. Watson said that his team at Jolly Roger is racing to develop self-cleaning rides now that are embedded with an antimicrobial coating. Realistically, you can't wipe down a ride every time a child has been on it, he said. Now, Tim, the big point of this article, though, is that he has not been paid back anything for that $64,000 because they are in bankruptcy and they're not paying vendors right now, correct? Right. And it, it just kind of hit at the wrong time, you know? Right. Because, I mean, I, I tell you what, my kids would love that ride. Yeah. They're train it fans. Looks like a ride. So, but that ride nobody has been on because he flew that ride over here from the UK, put it in a Chuck E. Cheese in Dallas, and it's just been sitting there because they're closed. 64K just sitting there. 
Yeah. It's crazy. But like I said, who, I mean, in Ch- I don't know how long this bankruptcy reorganization is going to take, Tim, but I mean, it's going to be for a long time before he's able to recoup that investment, correct? It's going to be a while. And then again, they're, they're going to struggle too is who's going to want to loan them money money. Exactly. Or to exactly. Credit. So, I mean, the other thing, though, the thing you sent me about this was that his company is developing that antimicrobial um, coated games. And I think that coating is actually produced by University Tim in the article. It talks about it. But they're actually going to coat games with this stuff so that they're kind of self cleaning, correct? Yeah, that was what caught my attention is that how after the coronavirus is over, or even during this pandemic, how things are going to change. And these games are coming out kind of coated uh, that self-clean uh, that keep them from getting, uh, uh, containing or holding the virus for people to touch them. Which, which is crazy. huge because, I mean, the amount of staff it takes to wipe down games, Tim, as you know, it's a lot of staff, correct? It's a lot of staff and it's a lot of time consuming. By the time you clean all the games, it's time to start over and clean again. Exactly. So if they're already self-cleaning, though, then, you, of course, that helps a ton. That will cut down on your labor costs significantly. It'll cut, it'll cut down on, um, on, uh, on, obviously, the viruses and the germs that are in your area. And so that could be a huge. It could be a huge market for games like that. And it looks like, Tim, that most manufacturers better be looking at a solution like that pretty quickly, right? I think so. And by law, you have to be doing such things. So you can't just not clean your games. And be open. You can say, well, the governor said I could be open, but here in Texas, you actually have to have somebody out there cleaning in order to be open. Correct. Yeah, and Tim, you know, where I work, we're a manufacturing plant, but we have a, a person who comes through three times a day and sprays everything with Lysol. Yeah. I mean, and that's so we can stay open, so. Right. But anyway, uh, Tim, it looks like Louie found um, whatever your little tune is. Um, he linked to it. It was a Yahoo post that he has in the live chat. He says, kids can hear high frequency sound that adults lose the ability to hear. That is the channel of those sounds. Um, and Blake said, thanks for the link. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Um, Everybody with teenagers are going to go try it now. Exactly. So, um, uh, I sent you a link, too, on your phone. Oh, oh okay, to the to the tone? Okay, I've got it here, too. The YouTube video is 21 seconds long. It's real short. There you go. So I'll check it out here after the live show, Tim. But uh, good stuff. There you go. But, Tim, I do feel bad. The whole point of that article was that they got the antimicrobial coating, and I do feel bad for the guy because, I mean, he's out $64,000 with no way to recoup at this point. So hopefully they can continue to stay in business, but it may be tough going going forward. And Tim, um, while I'm on this topic, man, I can't tell you how many places I've, how many arcades are closing down. Uh, golly, Tim, I've seen yeah. post after post after post. Uh, guys, we've tried to spread our money around by buying t-shirts and other things from arcades all over the place, but even with the support that we've been giving and others have been giving, it's still not enough to keep these places in business. Tim, there's a lot of arcades who still can't open up to this point. So again, just begging you guys, if there's, a, if you can support your local arcades in any way possible, please do, because otherwise they may not survive this. And there's going to be a lot, Tim, there are already a lot of arcades that have closed down, and who knows how many more are going to before this is over, so... Yeah, I don't think we've even seen the true economic impact. Some of these places are reopening and finding out they can't get supplies. Uh, you know, I noticed a couple of restaurants went open and then they found out their vendors were closed and they couldn't even uh, make some of the stuff that they used to make. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it, like you said, Tim, we may just be at the beginning of the fallout. So if you can support your local arcades and restaurants and bars, um, any way you can support them, whether that's drive through, pick up, picking up um, you know, food and drink items through a drive through or curbside, or if that's buying uh, merchandise, if that's donating to Patreons, GoFundMes. Tim, we've given money to a lot of different Patreons and GoFundMes for arcade support. Uh, it's just really, really hard to be an arcade owner. Guys, there are a lot of people... Who gave up their day jobs to open up arcades, you know, basically full time, and for that to be their business? And Tim, they're seeing their dreams die, and it is depressing as all get out. So if you can do anything to help these guys, I know that they would appreciate it tremendously. So, right. 
Okay, Tim, enough of a downer. Let us continue on in our discussion. And Tim, it looks like G4 may be making a comeback in some form. Uh, for those people who don't know what G4 is, G4 was a video game focused TV network. And they have teased that they may be returning in 2021. Um, and it, we really don't know what that's going to look like, Tim. It may be, um, you know, an online channel or it may be a different form altogether. But, Tim, I have some very fond memories of watching G4, watching um, shows like Icons and Starcade and yeah. uh, Attack of the Show okay. and uh, some of the other X-Play and some of the other shows on G4 TV. So, Tim, I am excited to see G4 back. Hopefully, um, it'll come back in a form uh, with a lot of the original content. But if not, I think it'll be just great to have a video game network back, period. What do you think? Oh, I think it's great. I can't wait. There you go. So hopefully we'll get to see a lot of uh, cool stuff from that. And Tim, the last piece of uh, discussion I have was actually posted by Mark, one of our Facebook moderators. But he said that 7-Eleven is offering arcade cabinet style Slurpee cups for a limited time. And Tim, I have a link to the post here for those people who are interested. The cups, Tim, in this particular case are non-licensed, okay? Not like the ones in the 80s. Remember, there were Slurpee cups in the 80s that were licensed, had like Galaxian, Galaga, Robotron, all that. Um, but these are unlicensed since they feature artwork depending, depicting a game called Slur Slurp Attack, and they also have straws with joysticks on them available. So if you have a 7-Eleven near you and you would like to get a cool arcade-shaped Slurpee cup, they are available. And uh, Tim, just, you know, it's cool to see stuff like that out, out there. It really makes you think to yourself that there's a lot of people who still appreciate arcade games, uh, even though uh, they're not as readily available to play as they used to be, so... Well, do we have a seven? I know we have one being built, but they're taking forever. So they, so, so the Seven Eleven um, franchisee here, they bought, I think, uh, some uh, another gas station uh, co franchisee company recently, and they're going to convert those to Seven Elevens. And plus, they're building a new Seven Eleven at our major intersection here in town. And so, uh, we do not have a Seven Eleven right now, but we have, you know, several that are coming, uh, you know, hopefully within the next six to eight months. So. Well, they need to get them open so we can get our That's cups. right, exactly. So, um, you know, Tim, I, I can't remember the last time I had a actual Slurpee. What Not about you? Me either. It's probably been 20 years or more. Exactly. So it'll be fun to have an actual Slurpee for once. Um, but God loves 7-Eleven, guys. Good stuff. So... Okay, guys. Well, I think it's about time to wrap it up, Tim. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do our wrap-ups here. So if you want to eat some spaghetti real quick, feel free to. But uh, we want to remind people that um, we want your arcade-related videos. So if you want some free advertising for your YouTube channel, we're looking for people to submit short videos around 10 minutes or less about arcade-related topics. Uh, you can send your link uh, or a link to your video to questions at arcaderepairtips.com, and our staff will review it. If we like it, we'll use it during one of our live show episodes. Um, make sure to put a plug-in for your channel so people will know where to find you. We look forward to seeing your submissions. And Tim, we always have that open for people. And we started doing that because, um, you know, YouTube started demonetizing people who didn't meet um, their new criteria. Um, they went up on their subscriber counts, their view counts, um, in order to qualify as being a YouTube partner. And so in order to help some of you guys who may be on just the cusp of being YouTube partners, if uh, you have content that's arcade related that we can feature on our channel to help you get more subscribers, we'd be happy to do that. And then, guys, here's all of our great contact information. We have our general email address at questions at arcaderepairtips.com, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. If you'd like your question mentioned on the show, put live show in the subject line, and we will do that. Otherwise, we'll just kind of pick them at random. If we feel like your question would be good on the show, then we'll do that. But you can send all of your arcade-related questions to questions at arcaderepairtips.com. And then we have our YouTube page. If you're watching this right now, you're probably watching it on our YouTube page. But if you're listening to this on the podcast feed, then you may want to watch the video version of that. If that's the case, make sure you go to youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. And comments from the last live show will be covered on the next episode. And Tim, some of the uh, YouTube comments we had from this episode were from that last episode. So again, guys, youtube.arcaderepairtips.com in order to watch all of our great videos and live show videos, uh, as well as all of our other arcade repair related content. And then we have our podcast um, email address that goes to Eric and Rusty, who host the Question and Answer podcast. And you guys can write them at podcast at arcaderepairtips.com. Tim, uh, you know, I haven't talked to them in a while, but I'm hoping that they're going to put out a new podcast sometime soon. Uh, they said they had already recorded some content for our podcast, but, you know, Tim, sometimes editing that all together can take time. And I know that they're probably busy cleaning all their games, considering that they do own an arcade. And like we mentioned earlier, you have to clean all the time. So more than likely they're busy, but hopefully at some point they'll get 
get around to doing a podcast. And when they do, you guys can send your questions to them at podcast at arcaderepairtips.com. Or you can also subscribe to those podcast feeds at itunes.arcaderepairtips.com or stitcher.arcaderepairtips.com. And make sure if you like what they're doing that you leave a review. Tim, the live show audio also gets posted on the, the podcast feed. So if you guys are listening to this on that, we thank you for subscribing, for listening to this, and listening to Eric and Rusty as well. Hopefully they'll be back with a new episode for you guys to enjoy very soon. Oh, leave reviews. iTunes, Stitcher, leave some reviews for for them and for us. We would highly uh, appreciate it. We really love to read all the great reviews you guys leave. And then we have our social media pages, Tim. We've got our Facebook page at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com. And Tim, we want to thank Mark and Louie for all of the hard work that they do on our Facebook page for posting all that stuff. I mentioned this month that Mark had posted the Slurpee, uh, the Slurpee um, cup thing that he found. Louie posts stuff all the time as well. But guys, um, neither one of those guys are paid. They're volunteer positions. But we want to thank Louie and Mark for all of their support. And Louie for doing moderation tonight and posting links as always. Thank you so much for that, Louie. Um, Louie is, is uh, very, 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 uh, very, very good, and uh, we just we just thank him so much for being for doing what he does on a volunteer basis. Louie, you're the man. So, and Mark, thank you so much for your contributions as well. Now, Facebook.arcaderepairtips.com is one way to get all your fantastic arcade repair related news, but you can also subscribe to our Twitter feed at twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. You can follow us there, send in your questions there as well, and all of the content from the Facebook page gets cross posted to the Twitter feed, so you won't miss anything if you do that. Well, Tim, I think it's about time to wrap up the show. We are going to have an after show tonight. We did not have one last night, so or last month, so I feel like it's been forever since we've just sat and talked. But um, do you have anything you'd like to tease for the after show that you personally want to talk about? Um, nothing. Nothing. No, I can't really think of anything. I was just sitting here thinking, gosh, we haven't discussed much after show topics. So much has been going down. I guess we'll just kind of update. Maybe we'll give our opinion on uh, wearing masks or something just to see what we can throw in a little controversy or there something. There you go. Well, we have some topics actually available. I don't know. Are, are, movies and TV shows, anything you want to talk about there, Tim? Or have you been too busy making uh, Dairy Queen food and tacos and things? <laughs> I have just been watching. Uh, by the time I get home, I've been uh, watching Shark Tank episodes I haven't seen, The Prophet. And by that time, I'm usually falling asleep and going to bed. I understand. Well, we'll talk about that in the after show if you want to hear that. Um, we'll be talking about, you know, some COVID-19 updates about what you guys are doing. Um, Tim will give some investment talk. I've got some talk I want to say on that point. Sports are back. Tim, let's talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, maybe some cord cutting talk. We'll kind of get that in there as well. Uh, Tim, I watched Hamilton. We can talk about that for those people who have seen that and some other things. But uh, if you want to hear about that, make sure you stay tuned to the after show right after the live show so i um, mean it'll, it'll be about five ten minutes we'll kind of reset and we'll be right here we'll do our after show if you're listening to this on the podcast feed you'll have to go to the youtube video and watch that to hear the after show so if you're interested in any of the topics we just discussed then make sure that you go to youtube look up episode 42 of the live show and check out the after show there tim let's wrap up the real show though do you have anything else before we uh, sign off and move into the sunset here well, I guess I should tease that I have decided to switch trading platforms. Really? Uh, using Robinhood, but nowhere near as much as this other one, and I am making a lot more money. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, if that's a teaser, if I've ever heard one. So you guys stay tuned there for the after go. show here in just a minute, about five minutes if you're with us live, and you'll get to hear what platform Tim has switched to in order to make all this money that he's talking about. And then, uh, guys, and then we'll talk about some other things. But we want to thank you guys for being here for the live show this month. It's been really great having the live chat here. And thanks for um, hanging with us through the delay there, Tim, while Tim was frantically driving back from Dairy Queen to get to his house so he could record with us. But, Tim, I want to thank you for being here and answering everybody's questions as always. We always appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, I was going 88 miles an hour trying to get back to 1985 and get out of 2020. <laughs> There you go. So, uh, well, guys, thanks again for watching. Thanks for bearing with us through the delay for this one. And uh, just continue to send in your questions if you have any. We'll be happy to answer those going forward. We'll love to see you guys next month for episode 43 in September, Tim. Golly, it's hard to believe it's already September 2020. But uh, we look forward to seeing you all then if you guys are getting off here. Otherwise, we'll see you in the after show. And remember, here at Arcade Repair Tips, when we fix the game, we play the game. Play and take care, game. everybody. We'll see you in the after show, or we'll see you next month for another Arcade Repair Tips live show. Take care, everybody, and good night.
you for watching this episode of the Arcade Repair Tips live show. All of our past episodes are available on our website at ArcadeRepairTips.com or on our YouTube page. This show is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. Please consult a professional before attempting to repair any coin-operated machines yourself. The preceding program is a Varcade Entertainment production. Okay, we're back. Man, that was quick. Um, I think I got you here, Tim. You want to say something real quick? Yeah, hello. There we go. I'm here. Okay, um, so, uh, guys, we're back. This is the after show. So the only difference between the regular live show and the after show is that the after show, no limit is off topic. Or, yeah, no topic is off limits. Look at that. No topic is off limits. We can talk about anything that we want to. You guys can continue to ask your arcade repair related questions, Tim, um, as well. We'll continue to get to those. But now, before we get started into our topics, Tim, we got a couple here in the live chat. Um, okay. Mr. Dwayne seventy nine says, "What do you guys think of The Rock buying the XFL?" And uh, Tim, this is an interesting question. You yep. and me both went to an XFL game this season. Um, we went to the same one on March first, and uh, I feel like March second is when everything changed. So um, we actually we were in a stadium with twenty thousand people on March first, twenty twenty. A lot of people can't say that, right? Right. So, 
But um, what do you think about The Rock buying the XFL? How do you feel about that? Well, yeah, I think it was a great investment for him. He don't have much at the price he got it for. Sure. It kind of was like pennies on the dollar. And so I, I think that'll be pretty interesting. I think I could see uh, him being involved. And he really didn't. At 15, was it $15 million? It just, I, I didn't see the price. but um, Yeah, maybe yeah. it's like $15 million. It, I'm not even saying it was basically a sale, you know. And uh, I don't know. I, I think it'll be interesting. I, I hope that uh, they do come back or at some point. Right, absolutely. I mean, guys, we had a good time at the XFL game. Didn't you have a good time, Tim? Oh, it was a great time. Tickets were reasonable. Um, you know, it was very cheap, in fact, for all of us to go, which I I, I fact, appreciated that. We we joked, but half jokingly, about maybe getting season tickets. How we would like to have went several more times if we could have. Yeah, we did talk about going several more times. Of course, they only had one more game after the one we saw, and then they disbanded the league. So, <laughs> um, but I don't know. You know, I don't know what that fifteen million or whatever he paid includes. I don't know if that includes the TV rights because some people were saying it does, some people were saying it doesn't. Um, I don't know what all of that is included with it, but um, but it does sound like a pretty good deal considering he got all the team names, all the artwork. I mean, basically, he could start up a football league today if he wanted to. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, wear so my all the stuff he got. Water. So, <laughs> what now? I still wear my Desperado shirt. Yeah, I've still got mine, too. We both have shirts. So, I mean, I'd love to see um, some more spring football. I mean, it was good. It was entertaining. It wasn't good football, but it was entertaining. That's what I will say. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was the best football, but it was entertaining football for sure. So, yeah, because how many picks did um, did our boy throw? Um, oh, uh, what was his name, Tim? Our Landry Jones. Landry Jones. Golly, he threw like four picks in the game. We were still in it till the end. So. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so we are, we are excited. I'd love to see some more um, XFL uh, action. So hopefully The Rock can do something good with it. And hopefully we'll be past this virus um, so he can do something good with it uh, when we get to 2021. Tim, how are you holding up? How have things been going for you in the COVID-19 era? Well, you know, every time you get the sniffles or, or your eyes are itchy or watery, you wonder. Um, I've had a couple of scares where I've, had to been, I've been tested twice. And both times were negative. Um, you know, we did have some people close to us that got sick, had hardly any symptoms at all, and were better. Uh, then I have an aunt right now that uh, was in the nursing home who's really sick at, you know, in critical condition in Louisiana. So, you know, it, it, it's like I, I, I waffle back and forth between um, you know, I certainly wasn't for shutting everything down, but then at the same time, I don't want anybody to get sick or die or from it. Seems to just be attacking people very differently. Yeah, and that's the thing, Tim, is that you know some people show no symptoms, some people's some people have symptoms for months. Um, you wow. know, it's really a weird thing. They're talking about Alyssa Milano today that she's been sick for three months, had three different tests, all tested negative, had an antibody test like a week ago, and it came back positive. And so, like, the tests aren't very accurate. That's something you guys need to keep in mind. And then, depending on how... This could affect you in wildly different ways. Tim, I read an article today about a guy that had actually his... Um, the COVID-19 caused his immune system to attack his brain. He went temporarily insane, doesn't remember anything. And after they started treating him with some steroids and things, only now is he starting to get back to normal. So, um... Well, that's, it, it's funny you said that. Yeah. I know a that has, uh, her husband has amnesia and literally cannot remember, doesn't know her. He cannot remember anything for about 20 years. He remembers growing up and being in the 80s and all this stuff. It's like he left in the 80s and came to 2020. Yeah. And, um, and it's been, you know, most amnesia lasts a day or two, maybe a week. It's been like three or four weeks and that's what they're thinking. It could be COVID related. Exactly. And, um, and Tim, this was the case out of Sweden that I'm talking about. There's a news story. You guys can read about it. But the brain fog is a symptom of uh, COVID-19. But again, these things affect people wildly different. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you may get that, you may not. You may have no symptoms. You may have tons of symptoms. You may have symptoms for three months. But that's the thing is we know so little about this that it's really hard to pinpoint how it's going to affect everybody. And so, you know, like you said, the shutdown... Uh, while some people may think it was overreacting, the thing is, is we just don't know enough to really pinpoint exactly what it's going to do to anybody. So, right. 
Uh, and you don't want to be one of those per people that has like long-term lasting effects from this because it does seem like there's quite a few people who are in that boat. So, But our, we had a neighbor who had it um, that she tested positive. Um, we've had... Um, We've had friends of friends who had it. Um, my, uh, you know, uh, someone at work that, that I work closely with, he did not get it, but his son got it, and they kind of quarantined him away, and it, did, it looks like the rest of his family did not get it. And so we, we have been semi, we haven't really been close to anybody who's gotten it, but we know, we know people who have gotten it and have tried to keep our best to keep a distance away. Um, YouTube Punk says, um, you know, lots of false negatives, tests aren't 100% reliable yet. Um, Dentonea says same thing. 50% of tests aren't accurate. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, Dentonea says my dad's trapped in a, in the VA hospital and he got COVID last month. And there's an see, app of keeping track of yeah. symptoms. So that's the hardest part. It's like my aunt was in the nursing home and had it, but nobody can see her. So, you know, here it is. If she makes it, we hope she does, and she is improving some, but let's say she died, it would have been the last four, five, six months of her life, nobody's even seen her. Right. Not even her kids or nothing. So that, to me, is the the worst thing, and we'll be praying for your father to recover. Absolutely. Den uh, that's a dentineus. Uh, dentineus. We will pray for your father to or recover. Or dentineus. Excuse me. Dentineus. I always say it wrong. Dentineus. Okay, okay. So... Yeah, we want to, we're we're praying for your dad. Hopefully, he recovers very quickly. And Tim, that's the thing, though. I mean, there's a vast majority of the population that just doesn't get any symptoms. So right. it's really strange how it affects everybody. So I mean, that's the biggest thing. There are so many unknowns about this, and that's really that's really what I think has led to to you know kind of the hysteria around it is that there's just so much we don't know about it. So. But uh, anyway, so, I mean, as far as we know, Tim, um, you know, we haven't had it around here. But like I said, my wife, you know, back in back on March 2nd, the day after we went to the XFL game, you know, she came down with some some something really nasty. And all of her tests have come back negative, too. But some of her symptoms were very classic of what we've seen with coronavirus. So you just never know. I mean, it, it's really it's really a strange time, I think, with um, with all this stuff. So hopefully you're you're being safe. You're practicing good hygiene, good uh, safe, you know, sanitary habits. Keeping your mask on, washing your hands, all that kind of good stuff. Because we don't want anybody to get it if you don't have to get it. So big time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Denatea says I am waiting on a lawyer to sign his will and his medical power of attorney, and they uh, and they need to have people witness the will. So there you go. Uh, tough tough stuff for sure. So praying for you. Uh, let's see. Anything else about COVID-19, Tim? Now, we should mention here that schools are about to open up. Yeah, and, you know, one thing that, I want to say, you know, my wife's a school teacher. One thing that is a little upsetting, I know that she'll have to wear a mask and they'll have to social distance, but there's still going to be like 20 kids in a classroom. How do you get 20 first graders to social distance? I'm a little disappointed that they're allowing that many kids still to be in a classroom together. Uh, we'll see how it goes, and maybe I'll have some updates next time after school starts. But it's pretty scary to, for her to have to go back into that environment. Um, like I said, and it, it, fortunately, kids have had the most resistance to it, it seems like, but not all kids. That's true. And not all little kids. Uh, so we'll just have to see. We definitely, I know she wants to go back to work and be in her classroom, but... Um, you know, I don't know. We'll I've see. seen the the plexiglass shields that they're putting in some of the classrooms to keep kids kind of in their area, and I know yeah. at some schools they're making it to where they the people your kids don't leave their classroom the entire day, so they they do all their work in the classroom. They you know they eat their lunch in the classroom, so they're only and so if there is an outbreak, it's basically centralized to that one room. It's not centralized to the whole school. So, right, that's kind of the approach I think that they're taking. Right, exactly. So, um, Mr. Dwayne 79 says, our school is distance learning for the first nine weeks. So, oh, that's, um, that's kind of what I thought they would do. Yeah. Uh, let's see. If I had kids, I would not send them back to school. That's what YouTube Punk says. Um, 
Denatea says there was a story about all of the kids that got COVID during summer break. Yeah, here's the deal is that kids, yeah, or summer camp, um, the kids are not immune to it, Tim. They can still get it. It's wow. just less likely than it is for adults. There are less cases in kids than there are in adults, um, which is good for school, but still, it doesn't necessarily mean your kid will not be one of the ones who gets it. So keep that in mind. But yeah, there was, I think there was a, a in Georgia, there was that big story about the summer camp, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, the one that tried to open here immediately had lots of outbreaks immediately, and they had to shut it down. Greg says, though being a teacher right now, ours uh, are all doing online. Oh, tough being a teacher right now. Ours are all doing online classrooms, but I know for my son, he does not do well start staring at a screen all day. And I think that's it, Tim. I mean, it's very hard. I mean, you have to be very disciplined to sit at a screen all day and learn. And so right. I think that's why the classroom is the better setting, but we have to keep kids safe too. Um, let's see. Mr. Dwayne says, this is my son's last year of high school and waiting to see if there is a, if there's a season of soccer. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Denatea says, I'm not sending my daughter back, but they want to go back on the 11th because they want to keep funding. Yeah, in some states, Tim, you can, only, you can only keep your funding if you do open on time and do the specific number of days, correct? All right. So, um, golly, guys, this is, this is tough. I mean, you've got school administrators making calls on some of this stuff, Tim, that they're just not used to making. And so, I mean, I, I just my thoughts and prayers are with people who are having to make these tough decisions and, and, and trying to figure out what they're going to do with the school year because, man, I don't want to be on a school board right now, so... Well, the deal is they don't know what to do, and neither would you if you were in that position. Exactly. So, you know, we, we can't really play armchair quarterback. We're just going to have to go with it, see what happens, learn, make different mistakes, um, change the way we do some things. But we can't just sit idly by. And I know a lot of people are just really, you know, on the teachers and the schools. It's not their fault. I think they're doing the best that they know to do. Absolutely. So... Um, but like I said, I mean, at, with the un upcoming school year, if, for the kids who are going back, just lots of prayers that, you know, everything's going to be okay. Um, and hopefully that the virus will will not affect most of them and that we'll be able to get through all of this okay. Um, but, Tim, you know, it's amazing, though. You look at sports I mean, you look at uh, Major League Baseball and, man, you've got these grown adults who are having problems with, with, uh, with, the, with uh, the virus as well. And so if you think yeah. if grown adults are having problems, social distancing and groups like this, I mean, how are we going to do it with kids, right? Yeah, I think it's so weird uh, seeing the players hit a home run and nobody high five them. Right. You know, social distancing in the dugout. It just in the cardboard cutouts in the stands. John, you'll have to tell everybody about your uh, your cardboard cutout. I do. I have a cardboard like. cutout at the at the Texas Ranger game. Um, they sent the seat assignment here. I'll find it here. I am in section 15, Tim. Uh, I think row seven. So yeah. I'm in a very good You're spot. I can tell you exactly where I am. <laughs> section 14, row seven. Yeah. If you're looking for me, I'm wearing a light blue powder blue shirt and a red Texas Ranger cap and, with a green background. So uh, if you see me out there, hi to all those Ranger fans. So um, I have been watching a lot of baseball, Tim. We'll go ahead and talk about that, um, even though the Texas Rangers are terrible this year. But, I mean, Tim, look at St. Louis and the Marlins, though. They basically had a, a huge, like, COVID-19 you know, infection right. between the two, those two teams and how they've had to delay all of the season stuff for them uh, in order to continue playing. I mean, it's a miracle that they've made it this far, in my opinion. Yeah, it's crazy. And then the, the basketball players all quarantined and playing on uh, in Orlando at Disney World and stuff. I just, you know, it's like we're desperate for some sports and we know football season's coming, which is the biggest sport. Uh, monetarily wise and everything um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out absolutely I mean football is the one I worry about the most Tim baseball is a very a very socially distant sport I mean as a whole that's what I yeah, exactly. But the thing is, is what happened apparently is, like for the Mar Marlins at least, is one of the players broke, or some of the players broke the protocol, went somewhere, and then they came back, and then they all got on a plane together, and they think the plane is where most of the other players got it. So you had a small group of players who went, broke protocol, went out somewhere like a bar or something, came back, and then the next day they all jumped on a plane together. Well, if you're on a plane together, Tim, pretty much everybody on the plane is going to get it. So. Yeah. But anywhere. 
anyway, so, um, you know, it is what it is, but uh, just, it's crazy. Football, I, I don't know how there's going to be a season this year. We'll see what happens, but if there is, I mean, there's already a lot of players who have opted out. I think like eight or ten uh, New England Patriots have already opted out, Tim. I saw that. So, I mean. I think they thought we're, our dynasty's over and we're not going to win very many games, so let's just opt out and take the seat, call it call the season incomplete instead of a loss. Exactly. So, um, but, you know, NBA and NHL are taking a little bit different. Like you mentioned, they're doing the bubbles. Um, so NHL has two bubble cities that they put everybody in. I think it's Vancouver, and I can't remember what the other one is. Uh, is it uh, Montreal? Vancouver, Montreal, and Canada, I think, is where they have everybody. So you're in e- either one of the two bubble cities. Uh, the N- NBA, of course, Tim, is all at Walt Disney World right now in the Walt Disney World bubble. But uh, it's really weird to see um, kind of these empty stadiums and things with, uh, like you say, cardboard cutouts and things. I don't know if we'll ever see this again, Tim. Who knows? Uh, but uh, And it's not quite the same watching sports with not a lot of cheering and stuff. Right, exactly. It's, that's what makes it fun. Oh, I agree. So... Uh, let's see. Um, YouTube Punk says, Jonathan not wearing his uh, Arcade Repair Tips jersey. Man, if I'm at the Ranger game, I'll wear my Ranger jersey. So, uh, always. So, And, Tim, I got one of the powder blue um, jerseys, like the new ones with the Rangers across the chest. I've been wanting yeah. one of those for a while. So, um, But I'm not in that one. I'm in one that says, it's powder blue. It says Rangers, but it's a 1970s style jersey. So, if you see me out there. Section 14, row 7. I'm in there. Um, but, anyway, let's see what else we have here. Deniteus, some of them opted out because they had kids, uh, kids visitation. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, if you've got kids, you got to be careful. I mean, obviously the COVID nineteen, you don't want your family to get it or whatever the case may be. So I think for a lot of professional players, it's better for them to opt out, right? Yeah, especially if you have like special needs kids or something that, or somebody that could be really at risk. Well, let's go ahead, Tim, and move on to your new platform since you teased that so hard right after, <laughs> right at the end of the actual live show. So you, you're still using Robinhood. You should mention that. It's just that you're, yeah. you've, mo- you've moved most of your investments to another platform. What have you moved to? Webull. Okay, now you've told us about Webull before, but you've, you've right. made more of a change to move over to Webull now, right? Yeah, way more of a change. Um, in fact, any kind of heavy investing or money involved of any sort I would definitely trade on Webull and I've learned a lot more um, Webull has the tier one and tier two levels where you can watch you can see what the upcoming bids are it's easier to tell if a stock's going up or down they have all their indicator lines um, it's a little bit more advanced but once you use it it's really not that bad and they have a desktop version which really makes it easy but the main thing is for central time that we live in Johnson I can start trading at 5 a.m. and trade till 7 p.m. and so if I hear a breaking news or what happened the other day like I said I would have uh, sent you a message or some stuff it's 5, eight, five o'clock in the morning and uh, I heard that Trump had made an announcement about Kodak. Did you hear what happened to Kodak? Yes, stock? yes, I did. Okay. Well, I'll just say this. I, I don't want to brag or nothing. Just got lucky because we bull I could get in very early in the morning. I bought a hundred shares, uh, less than um, less than a way under a dollar a share. Wow. And uh, and so it definitely took off. Uh, later that day, and I would by the time Robinhood opened, it was probably already at thirty dollars a share. So, you know, to give you an idea of the difference, uh, a lot of those movers are already moving before Robinhood opens. You can tell, and uh, you can get in and get out. Also, I switched to a cash account. Uh, if you're familiar with that, Jonathan. Uh, I can do unlimited day trades, um, except for uh, once, let's say, it's working out great for me because I'm really only off one weekday a, a week. So I can not I can trade as many times as I want to that day, and then I can't trade again until the funds settle, which is usually about two or three days, but certainly by the next week. But I'm not limited to the three trades per day rule under there, the way they do it. Gotcha. So that's another plus. I can uh, kind of take a gamble, but once I buy stock, I have, I'm committed to that. I have to have the extra money uh, 
just because I have extra trades, I can um, I have unlimited trades. I still have unlimited fun. Gotcha. So. Yeah, um, you know, uh, actually, Tim, one of my stocks has been going through the roof. Now, I still have Dave & Buster's stock, and it has dropped tremendously. I will say that, as you would probably expect it to, because they're not open right now in a lot of places. But um, So that has been my big loser. My big winner is Square, though. And, Tim, I, yeah. you know, we've been talking about Square for a long time. I, have, I bought Square at $19 a share, Tim. It is now $154 wow. a share. So they wow. beat earnings by, like, 40%. And it shot up fifty bucks a share um, over the uh, over the last like three days, and so um, and it's because you know a lot of these businesses that may not have had online payment platforms before COVID nineteen, yeah. they had to sign up for one, and Square was one of the most popular, and so their sales have there because all of the people that use Square, their sales have shot to the roof. Square sales is shot through the roof because they take a percentage of every transaction, or you pay a flat fee, and then um, you can you can pay less per transaction. But Square is a credit card processing company that allows you to do it on your cell phone, as well as with the different Square devices that they have available. And so, um, Tim, Square is my big winner for this month, and Dave and Buster's my big loser for this month. So, um, <laughs> Dave and Buster's, I have I have confidence that they're going to be able to weather the storm and come back. I'm hoping I'm not fool foolish in saying that, but. Um, you know, uh, it really is a tough time for the entertainment in industry, like we've talked about this show. So, well, I guess I should talk about a big loser then uh, for me. Because, yeah, you gotta. Uh, you see, you uh, can't just revel in your successes, Tim. You gotta also revel in your failures. Like I said, people knew I wasn't Dave and Buster's, you know, stockholder. Guys, I, I have. I, that's a stock I intend on holding, but right now, man, it's hard to hold on to. It has dropped so much, so. Well, I made a rookie mistake, and let me tell you what I did. Um, IZEA is uh, trying to buy TikTok, okay? Right. And if you know that, that they're trying to shut down TikTok, and when they do, Microsoft indirectly owns IZEA. And anyway, so I looked for it to go tremendously up, but when I typed in the ticker and didn't have my glasses open on, I ended up buying IEA, oh my which is an energy stock. And so I missed a Z. And uh, so uh, I knew I would might have to hold for a little bit. And then I realized I bought the wrong stock. And energy stocks are not doing too good right now. Oh, yeah. So that was my big loser. Well, here's the deal, but though. I mean, if you hold on to that energy stock, it'll probably come back. Because, I, I mean, energy is going to come back. The only good thing is I may hold on to it a while now that I'm in it. Now, Tim, I've got a one to watch because I've been watching it for a while. It's been holding pretty steady. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my app real quick just so we can talk about it. And I don't know if you've heard TTOO. Are you familiar? No. That's the ticker. TTOO. Okay. okay, so TTOO is T2 Biosystems, and Tim, they have been coming up with a test for COVID-19, or been trying to. They've been trying to get emergency FDA approval for that test. Apparently, it's it's supposed to be fairly, or maybe more accurate than the stuff that we've had up to this point, but um, they have not yet received the FDA approval for it yet, um, but it's an emergency approval, so it should go through pretty quickly, and I think once they once they hit that emergency approval, then the stock will jump a bit. So right now it's been hovering around where it's at, which is about yeah around a dollar fifty to dollar seventy five a share, depending. But um, I'm hoping once they get that FDA approval that we're going to see a shoot up. Tim, they're supposed to have a reverse stock split um, here in a couple of days, and they canceled it. And so I'm hoping the oh, fact okay. that they canceled it means that good news is on the horizon. So, um, but well, I'm I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm not telling you to sell it because, you know, I don't give advice. I'm saying you should watch it and do some due diligence on it and see what you think. I do hold shares. I'm not telling you how many. Yeah. Uh, after a dollar fifty, it, it around that dollar fifty range, it shot up to two seventy two before. It has. And that that is on good news. And Tim, like I said, they, they have developed a COVID test that they think is more accurate than some of the ones that we're currently using, and they're just waiting for the emergency FDA approval on it. And so if they get the emergency FDA approval, I think that well obviously they're gonna be selling tests, which right now are still high in demand. Tim, we're still falling way short on testing, still. And so, um, you know. Now, one thing that we did recommend before is that Robinhood now lets you buy partial shares. And um, so, one thing I did make some money off, and that's why I keep my Robinhood account and my Stash account is buy partial shares of Amazon. Yeah. I've been buying that for a couple months now, thinking 
everybody I know is ordering stuff through Amazon. You got toilet paper and Lysol wipes through Amazon. I did. So I knew, and did you hear about their earnings call? They were up 42%. Yeah, I mean, and, look, when a website uh, has to change their platform to promote people not buying things like they had to do during the, the uh, epidemic, that just tells you right there that they're going to, they're probably making good money, so. So, if you think about it, guys, you say, well, I can't afford a $2,000 stock, but maybe you can afford 50 bucks. Uh, if it goes up 40%, you're still at $90 or $80 or something. You can easily turn a 50 into 80 or a 500 into 800 even on those uh, big stocks like that. Retail stocks so as a whole is, are doing really well right now, especially big retailers. Target, Best Buy, Walmart are doing really well. Probably will continue to do well. So um, not bad investments yeah. on those for sure. Yeah, I bought Abbott Industries and Walmart uh, at the 1st of March. And you see what they have both been doing. You know, you hear their name a lot. Uh, Trump's a big Abbott supporter because and, and they're a big pharma that can do the testing and stuff they've had a test out now they're the ones that the test that they use for him when he has people it's real rapid testing so right so good stuff guys and if you're not investing make sure that you i mean there's no time like the present to get in tim even though the markets are kind of fluctuating right now you can there's always opportunities to make some money if you do some due diligence and some research so if you want to you can click on our robin hood links below to get you a free stock um so those are below in the show notes or you can also um oh what is it you can if you sign up for my Weevil account, you'll get two stocks. Two stocks if you sign up through <laughs> Tim's Weevil account. So I, I don't know if you have the URL or whatever it is, Tim, but... I'll put it there. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so we'll put it up in the show notes as well if you guys want to sign up there. Um, Tim, let's go ahead and shift real quick. Um, so I'll talk about what I've been watching. We'll go ahead and move to TV shows because we're kind of running long here. But okay. um, do you want to talk about... Now, you just said um, The Prophet and Shark Tank. Two, two shows that I've watched a lot of. Both I enjoy, so... Have you seen anything else recently, yeah, though? Watching old, watching old episodes. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, um, so me and the wife, you know, had been continuing to watch The Middle, uh, which you recommended, and they took it off IMDb now. Oh. And I can't find it anywhere. So um, just a big bummer. I was... No, I can't find it anywhere. Um, I don't know if it's streaming anywhere else now, but um, I we were halfway through season two, so... Uh, and it man, some of those episodes are downright funny. So if you if you just like sitcom, if you just like silly sitcoms, man, the middle is it. I love that thing. So we've really been enjoying it though. So, so let uh, Tim. Is there anything else you want to talk about though? Any movies, TV shows, anything like that you've seen? Well, I haven't really watched any movies. Um, man, nothing. I can't even think of anything we've seen lately. Um, that's not on TV or something. It's a TV show we've been watching. That's about it. So I'll go ahead and I'll talk about a couple. Uh, Tim, we got HBO Max when we changed our wireless account recently. So I now right. have an H HBO Max account, which I've never had HBO before in my entire life. So I'm discover. Well, I take that back. I had access to an HBO account thanks to my brother. I was kind of I was kind of off his. But um, we actually have uh, HBO Max now. We actually have an account. The only thing I don't like about HBO Max is it doesn't have a Roku app. And we have Rokus mainly through our house. So I'm having to watch it on some, like my phone and some different things. But Tim, let me just talk about some of the shows that are in HBO right now that you need to check out. Um, okay. There's a movie on HBO called Bad Education. And it, and it has, um, oh golly, Hugh Jackman in it. Okay, and it's about this superintendent of schools, I think in New Jersey, who embezzled like two or three million dollars. So, okay. but it's got Hugh Jackman in it and some other great actors. And it's again, it's on HBO, but it's called Bad Education. Um, it was made by HBO as an HBO movie, so um, you guys can check that out. I thought it was really good. I like Hugh Jackman though, Tim. Huge Hugh Jackman fan because of X Men and Wolverine and all that kind of stuff. But he does really good in this. Um, it's a different part for him, but yeah, like him and this other and his assistant lady end up embezzling something like ten million, fifteen million dollars from the school district. Wow! Okay. And, and basically, that's the entire story. So you should watch it if you're interested in that for sure. Um, interesting stuff. Tim, I mentioned earlier I watched Hamilton. Have you seen Hamilton? No, I I'm, I have heard of it, but I have not seen it at all. Okay, so let me tell you what I thought of Hamilton before I saw it, because I don't know how you think of it. I listened to the music and I thought, man, this is, I don't like the music that much. 
I it, it does oh. doesn't speak to me. Then I watched the musical and I realized the music's not supposed to speak to you. The music is wound around the story so tightly that the music is the story. And so you can't it's hard just to listen to the music and get a picture of what's going on in Hamilton. You really need the entire picture. So you need to watch you need to watch the musical to really get how the music is wrapped around the story. But I tell you what, uh, it will give you a new appreciation of Alexander Hamilton. Tim, I knew a lot about Alexander Hamilton already just from history, but um, some of the other things that he went through, I was not I did not know as much of like him losing his son and some other things. So spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, but uh -huh. um uh, it was very good, and if you have Disney Plus, uh, or even if you don't, uh, buy a month of Disney Plus to watch it because it is worth it. It's really good. I like it a lot. So, okay. so Disney Plus has it though. Hamilton, like I said, buy a month, Tim. Watch that, and then you can get off. Actually, Tim, if you buy a month of Disney Plus, watch that and The Mandalorian because The Mandalorian is very good on there as well. Oh so. yeah. But um, uh, YouTube Punk says. Uh, our Greg says Hamilton drove me nuts after five uh, five minutes. YouTube Punk says I can only watch about thirty. If you're not a musical person, you may not like it. Um, but it's not really a musical, Tim. It's like a hip hop history lesson. That's really what it is. So um, okay. le le less of a musical, more of a hip hop history lesson. So, um, but it is. It's it, like I said. It's not really a musical in the in a traditional sense for sure. So um, let's see. More HBO Max stuff, Tim. I watched Love Life with Anna Kendrick, and it is a show on HBO Max, exclusively on HBO Max. You have to have HBO Max for it. About a young woman and basically her entire love life from the first time, from like the first time she has a date till the time she finds the one. And each episode kind of chronicles a different part of her love life and a different person that she meets along the way. It is very well done. It is the second most watched thing on HBO Max for a reason. And um, I like Anna Kendrick. She's a good actress anyway, but she really does shine in this in this show in particular. So Love Life on HBO Max. Check it out if you haven't already. Tim, uh, season two of Doom Patrol is also on HBO Max. I love uh, season one of Doom Patrol. And while season okay. two is not quite as good, it is almost as good as season one. So if you're a Doom Patrol fan, you should watch it. The only thing is that today they released the final episode of the season and there was supposed to be one more, but they shut down because of COVID-19. So this ends up becoming the finale, and it leaves uh, you hanging something awful. So, um, uh, and it, it, they did not, the writers did not mean to do that, but they got shut down before they could film the last episode of the season. So it's supposed to be a 10-episode season, it ended up being nine, and the last one leaves you hanging something awful. Sorry. So, I mean, it is what it is. Can't help that. But it's still worth watching. Doom Patrol is the most weird show on television, Tim. I hope it gets renewed for a season three because it is so weird. So weird. But I don't know why. I just, there's, I just love it. It is so quirky. I like it. I like it for its quirkiness. So. Okay. And then, Tim, uh, probably the favorite, my favorite thing we've been watching is Perry Mason on HBO with uh, Matthew Reese. Um, so have you seen Perry Mason? Uh -huh. Uh, the old school one I haven't seen. The this is one. the prequel. So this is a prequel to the old school one, and it basically tells you how Perry Mason became Perry Mason. Perry Mason is uh, is um, played by Matthew Reese in this, which is from The Americans. You may remember him as Philip Jennings in The Americans. Um, and he was also in um, the uh, uh, well, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood with Tom Hanks. He also played in that. Right. But Matthew Reese does a fantastic job in this. The first four or five episodes are kind of slow moving and then in episode six they get into the courtroom stuff and it is fantastic the season or the season finale is sunday night and i am looking forward to it um, just as my, just about as much as i looked forward to all the americans episodes that he was in so um but if you even have a, a, a passing fascination with perry mason you should check it out and it's on regular hbo so you can have hbo hbo go or hbo max and watch it it's good stuff um and then, Tim, I've been watching Stargirl, which is on DC Universe. It's also on the CW. Um, it has Luke Wilson in it, uh, but it's a superhero show made by the same people who make The Flash and Doom Patrol and um, Air also made Arrow. But um, I tell you what, Luke Wilson and Amy Smart are in it. Amy Smart from Just Friends, if you remember that movie. But um, yeah. uh, both of them do fantastic, and the lead girl who plays Stargirl does good. It's actually more enjoyable than I thought it would be. Really liking Stargirl. And then, Tim, I've been watching the final season of Mar Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on ABC. So those are the things that I've been watching lately. I've been, I've been 
really maxing out my HBO Max account. Um, Tim, they've got a lot of content on HBO Max. The only downside is that if you have a Roku stick, you're out of luck. Or a Fire, even a Fire stick, you're out of, out of luck. you got to watch it on like a PlayStation 4, or on a on your phone, on a tablet, on a, on a Xbox, because they've got a dispute right now between Roku and they Roku and Amazon and they're not letting the plat they're not letting HBO Max on those platforms. Oh, wow. Yeah, it sucks. So, but anyway, um, good stuff. Watch all that stuff. So, Bad Education with uh, Hugh Jackman. Hamilton, I thought was good. You may need to be more of a musical person according to the live chat, but I liked it. Uh, Love Life, Doom Patrol, and Perry Mason on HBO Max. Check out all of those. And then Stargirl and Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on uh, CW and ABC, respectively. So, Tim, is that everything? Did we cover everything? I think so. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before we go? Is everything everything's okay with yeah. you? You're, nobody, obviously, nobody around you is sick except for just a couple of like outside connections, right? Yeah, just here and there, you know, just it, before I didn't know anybody. Now it's like I hardly know some some connections to me, whether it be church or family or friends that hasn't been affected some way or knows somebody. Here's a has. quick question: Are you going to church? No, we have still opted for uh, watching online. I don't know if we are getting lazy at it or we just want, we just prefer it. Um, and with the way I've been working, Sunday's one of my only days off, so a lot of times I just sleep in. We just watch the replay. I, I've probably seen more church uh, because I like to watch uh, several different people, and we'll kind of watch. And, and you cut out all the singing or something, you just get out of the sermons like. 19 minutes or something and so I can watch like two or three you know <laughs> so, um, no we haven't really started back and um, probably should but not, not yet so I mean are they having in-person services at your church they are but what was uh, what they were doing was they were limiting the amount our church holds about 300 they were limiting the number to about a hundred so you kind of had to not buy a ticket but kind of reserve a spot and then you kind of felt like, well, if I reserve a spot and somebody else doesn't get to go, uh, you know, then you kind of felt like, well, I'll let them go. But then, I don't know, it's kind of a weird way to have to do it so they could social distance and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, so our church has had in-person services. Um, our church, we usually do about 200 on a Sunday, but lately with COVID, I mean, there's maybe 30 or 40 there because i mean a, a lot of our church is older and so um yeah. you know a lot of those older people are just not going to come because i mean they don't want to get it and so i mean they haven't had to put a cap on it but you know the governor here in texas says you really shouldn't have groups over 100 which is why your church is probably doing what they're doing um you know so if you do have a church over 100 tim a lot of those are just opting for online services because of that of course you know, it just depends on where you're at as to what the rules are right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, we've been going to church recently every Sunday, so. So, and it, I mean, it's good, but it's it's just, it's different. Everybody wears their mask, you know, so uh, every, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. You don't touch any surfaces, and, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So. Um, before we leave, I'm going to live chat. Um, we're about to head out, but if any of you guys have any um, shows or movies or sports that you want to talk about, let us know. Um, Tim, like we said, I don't know how the NFL is going to do this season. That's kind of weird. I'm going to continue to watch baseball and hockey and basketball and just see how things go with that. Uh, but um, overall, I think, you know, it's just we're going to continue to do, you know, what we can to keep ourselves safe. And, and uh, hopefully we'll get through all this mess sooner rather than later. So anything you want to say before we sign off, Tim? No, just thank everybody for, like I said, your patience and everything. Um, I did, I got to get going because I got to be up for work in the morning, and um, I've got to go to the store tonight. So. Golly, Tim, man, burning the candle at both ends like always. I see. I, I, Tim, I haven't talked to you. This is the most I've talked to you in the last month, just because you know you've been busy, I've been busy, and uh, I know hopefully things will settle down. Then we'll actually be able to get together one of these you know months. So. I hope so. so maybe I, I keep wanting to say next live show we're going to be in the same room together, but you know then as soon as I say that the case is skyrocket. So I'm hoping. I will say this, and this will be a great teaser. Something like you said, we haven't talked. Uh, Mike has uh, been. Re I've been helping him more on a consulting basis, but I probably will help him with some of the wiring and stuff. Our friend Mike is just about through. Uh, with his part of the arcade that he wanted to build with a refrigerator in it. Oh, gotcha. And so, uh, we'll call it the cooler case. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll post some pictures and stuff when we see it. It's actually 
kind of cooler than I thought. And uh, he may have a buyer, so I need to help him get it finished and get it together uh, so he can uh, make a little money off of it. But anyway, uh, he has another guy just seeing the pictures of how it is so far. Of course, it's not wired up or playing. Um, was he was really interested in maybe getting one also so uh, I have been talking to him a lot and helping him giving him some ideas and uh, anyway if you guys are interested in that we basically put a took out the coin box took all the guts out and put a refrigerator in where that would be so you still have a game but there's a refrigerator at the bottom now, I've seen some people doing that with Arcade 1-Ups, too. I don't know if you've seen that, Tim. There's apparently a mini fridge that fits perfectly in the spot where the little slide-in bezel goes on the Arcade 1-Up. And so people have been buying those refrigerators and just popping them in the Arcade 1-Ups to sell like that, too. So, But anyway, people like having their drinks in their, their, their uh, arcade experiences all together, right, Tim? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to let you go so you can go to sleep and so everybody in the live chat can... can uh, can hang on, uh, it can uh, get some sleep as well. Um, Seahorses at Night says, Coming soon, Super Epstein didn't kill himself, Tim. Just remember that. <laughs> and uh, we hope to see you guys all back here for the next live show in September, episode 43, Tim. Looking forward to it. And until then, guys, we hope that you all are safe and uh, just uh, spend some time with your families. Have a, a great month of August, and we'll be back here in September for the next live show. Take care, everybody, and good night. Good night.